digestive system consists of your digestive, digestive tract and your accessory organs of digestion. The digestive tract is your mouth, your pharynx, the esophagus, stomach, small intestine, large intestine. That's the tract. Okay. Accessory organs of that tract are your teeth, the tongue, salivary glands, pancreas, liver, and your gallbladder. Okay, these are the divisions here. What is that? There we go. Okay, so the digestive tract runs from your mouth to your anus. Okay, the, the subject you have the oral cavity. We'll go over when each of these sections. We'll go over in detail. So you have the oral cavity, which is the mechanical processing, chewing the food. You moisten it up and it makes it just uh, secretions. So it puts it into bowls form that you can swallow. Then the pharynx. Remember the pharynx has three divisions, nasal pharynx, oral pharynx, and uh, laryngeal pharynx. Okay. So the pharynx is pulls the material into the esophagus. So it takes the food you swallow from the mouth and constricts the smooth muscles around it, constrict and push it into the esophagus. The esophagus is a tube that transmits it between the oral cavity into the stomach. In the stomach, it reads chemicals, hydrochloric acid, et cetera, and different digestive chemicals to help break down the food. Okay, you get muscular contraction and help push it together and mix that those secretions together. Then it goes into the small intestine, which wants to produce different enzymes and it breaks down the food. And that's where most of your absorption occurs is in the small intestine. Okay, it absorbs all the it absorbs water, shown dehydrate, or organic substrates, vitamins, and ions. Then we go to the large intestine. Okay, you still get more enzyme digestion, absorption of water, organic substrate, vitamins, and you get some digestion, not as much as small intestine. Okay. To help all that along, you have salivary glands. You have three types up in the, uh, the head and neck area. You have the parotid gland, sublingual glands, and submandibular glands. Okay, they secrete fluids and enzymes that break down the carbohydrates. Then you got the liver, secretes bile. Okay. Okay, that's a, a storage of nutrients and many other vital functions. Uh, aged lipid, the bile, aged lipid or fat, fat digestion. The gallbladder stores and concentrates bile. Do not get mixed up. The bile does not produce, I meant bile, sorry. The gallbladder does not produce bile. It stores it. So bile is secreted from the gallbladder, but that's only a storage organ. The bile is manufactured or produced in the liver. That's if you take your gallbladder out, you can function just fine. Just to watch your diet with fatty foods, you're not storing bile anymore. But the liver secretes, the liver produces the bile. The gallbladder is just a storage tank. That's all it is. It modifies and concentrates the bile. Okay, and then it secretes it into the, the calm bile duct. Okay, so don't get confused when you get talk about the gallbladder. The gallbladder does not produce bile. Okay, then you have your pancreas which is the exocrine and endocrine organ. We'll talk about both those functions. And that's it. All right. Okay, so function of your digestive system. Ingestion, okay, mechanical processing, digestion, secretion, discrete enzymes and different um, uh, acids, things like that. Absorption, excretion, and compaction. Those are the functions of the digestive system. Okay, ingestion, bringing food and liquids into the mouth. We're good at that, right? That's what I'm doing right now. We, we, can, <laughs> we can do that very well. <coughs> we can even do that while we're listening to anatomy lectures. Okay, so ingestion is the act of taking food and bringing it into your mouth. Mechanical processing, you're chewing it up, Forcing it to come together, breaking it down, chewing and swallowing food. Digestion. Digestion is a chemical breakdown of food into form that can be absorbed by the intestines. It breaks, it, it breaks the proteins down in a smaller chain, smaller chains in, into amino acids that can be absorbed through the intestinal tract. Secretion. Secretion of products by the lining of the digestive tract and the secretion product of accessory organs of digestion, like your salivary glands and so forth. Absorption, the movement of the nutrients from the small intestine into the bloodstream. So we take all that stuff that we've chewed up, broken down, 
enzymatically, enzymatically broken down into amino acids, and, and now we can absorb it for nutrients in the small intestine. Then we have to excrete the leftovers, the stuff we can't use. It has to be removed. You can't just build up in your body. So excretion is removal of the waste products from the digestive tract. And compaction is dehydration of organic waste. When that stuff's being excreted, we take all the water out of it. So it becomes solid. That way your body doesn't dehydrate. Okay. Now, since I'm a dentist, sugar is one of the products that we digest a lot of. It's a big problem in our society today. I don't know what you're eating, but it might probably be sugar. <laughs> sugar is necessary part of your diet. It supplies energy, which it does. Glucose is produced by plants through photosynthesis. So we use glucose to provide energy to our bodies. <coughs> okay, But not all sugars are equal. Okay, When two single sugars are combined, they form a disaccharide. That's not glucose. That's the dangerous kind. That's when it becomes dangerous to the body. Important because when you consume a single sugar, those are monosaccharides. They're absorbed directly into your bloodstream. You, you absorb glucose, it goes right into your bloodstream. When you ingest disaccharides, your body has to first split the sugar mole before it can move the blood into the bloodstream. So it means it digests more slowly. It gets stored. Okay. There's three types of disaccharides. So mono, mono, disaccharides are two monosaccharides that come together. And each is present specific foods. Okay. So a disaccharide is a double sugar from two monosaccharides by dehydration reaction. You learn that in organic chemistry, you, you take water away from the reaction. Okay, so when glucose and galactose combine, you give off water. So it's a dehydration reaction. Water is given off, okay, and it forms a link between the two. Now this is a disaccharide, and this is lactose. Lactose is found in milk. That's one of the sugars in milk. If you have a, a, a baby, never, or an infant, never put the infant to bed with a bottle in his mouth with milk. Milk has lactose. Lactose is sugar. Okay, it's what, what will result in what's called grenade mouth. And it looks like grenade went out from baby. Now everything will be black, will be dark, the teeth will be destroyed. And we see that a lot. We get what's called baby dentures because all the teeth are destroyed. And that happens from lactose. Okay, so lactose is a very potent sugar. It's a disaccharide and it's one of the ones found in milk. So your lactose is found in milk. It's made from the monosaccharides, glucose and galactose. Maltose, that's one of the ones in beer. You, know, you don't give the baby a bottle of beer either. <laughs> Who knew, right? No, you don't get So beer has a lot of sugar in it. That's why you get beer bellies, because they don't break it down. It stores fat. So malto, lactose is in milk. Malto, uh, maltose is in beer. Malted milkshakes, malted milk ball candy. That's glucose and, and a, that's two glucose molecules that join together. And then sucrose. Sucrose is your table sugar. What you pour into all your drinks, your Cokes, Coca Cola, and everything that has sucrose in it. And we even modify that to make it worse. I'll show you that in a second. It has glucose and fructose. All right. So sucrose is the main carbohydrate in plant sap. What we do is we modify it, we make it even worse. We turn sucrose into high fructose corn syrup. That is one of its most products. That is what's extremely dangerous. That causes heart disease, causes obesity causes extreme dental decay, causes uh, all kinds of diabetes, type two diabetes, it causes all kinds of stuff. And we make it that way because high fructose corn syrup tastes sweeter than sucrose, so people like it. That's the only reason we make it, we perfectly design it to be worse because it tastes better. So this is a commercial process that converts natural glucose into corn syrup to the, sweet, to the fructose molecule. So high fructose corn syrup is one of the first ingredients like listed in soft drinks. If you look at your can, you can see right here, look at any soda pop can, you will see high fructose corn syrup as one of the first two ingredients usually. Phosphoric acid. So look at most Coke cans, Pepsi, I'm not picking on Coke, Pepsi, Coke, uh, Minimate orange juice, any of these sodas, okay? You're producing high sugar and you're producing acid, phosph uh, phosphoric acid, 37%. That's because of the tangy taste. Both are extremely bad for the body, okay? So they take corn, they break it down, starch into glucose and fructose, and they turn natural starches into high fructose corn syrup. Okay? So the average American consumes 45 kilograms of this sugar every year. That's 100 pounds of sugar. And it's mostly as a sucrose and high fructose corn syrup. 
That's 100 pounds. So imagine 100 pounds of sugar on a scale. That's a tremendous amount of sugar. Okay, And that's your high fructose. That's what, that's what the average American consumes on a yearly basis. Major cause of tooth decay, overconsumption, like take type 2 diabetes, heart disease, things like that. This is an interesting chart. It shows you certain things about what you're drinking. If you look at pure water, this is a pH column right here. These are pHs. Okay. This is the amount of sugar that's in the drink. Now, pH of seven is neutral. That's water. That's what your body's balanced at. pH of a battery acid. Battery acid has a pH of one. Now, pH is a logarithmic scale, which means it goes up by 10 or down by 10 every time. So from seven to four, seven goes to six is 10, six goes to five is 100, five goes to four is 1,000. So the 1,000 fold difference between natural water and Bark's root beer, okay, it's 4.1. Look at Coca-Cola, look at Pepsi, 2.53. It's one-tenth the strength of battery acid. And you can prove that. Take Coca-Cola and pour it on a, when you have a, a trailer hitch, the, the bolt that won't loosen, it's rusted shut, pour Coca-Cola on, let it sit for a couple minutes. It eats it right away, you take the bolt off. Okay. It's just 10, it's one-tenth the strength of battery acid, Pepsi and Coca-Cola. And look at the amount of sugar in it, nine teaspoons in a 12-ounce thing. That's a lot of sugar in one cup. Look at Hawaiian fruit punch. Hawaiian fruit punch, you give your kids. 2.8, okay, Real, just tenth, a tenth away from battery acid. And then the seven is 10.2 tablespoons, teaspoons. Tremendous amount of sugar and acid. It destroys teeth. Teeth start to be destroyed at a 5.5. So anything below 5.5 of the pH is acidic enough to actually eat away through your tooth. Okay, and then every single one of those drinks is below 5.5 pH. Okay, some are amazing. Look at orange slice, almost 12 teaspoons of sugar and a pH of three. Okay, those are close to battery acid. So that's amazing what we, we put in our bodies. So a 20 ounce Coke has 16 teaspoons of sugar. So 16 sugar cubes. That's a tremendous amount of sugar. Organi a histological organization of the digestive tract. There's four major layers of the digestive tract. There's the mucosa inside. Then you got a submucosa below that. Muscularis externa, which is your smooth muscle, and your serosa, which is your outside layer. So this whole time I was like, is my um, the book like out of order or something like that? Because of all these slides that you were showing, and I didn't have any. <laughs> and now we're back. No, that, was, that was just my kind of sidetrack. You know, can I give you a little, a little something different to think about every once in a while? <laughs> okay, so here's your four tracks. So but we're back with the book now, right? We, we yeah, should have along the chapters in the book. All right. <laughs> All right, so the inside is the mucosa. mucosa. This is your inner lining right here. Okay. Your submucosa is the layer below that, connective tissue. Your muscularis externa, like I said, is your smooth muscle around your gut. And the serosa is your visceral peritoneum, visceral meaning surrounding the, the organ. Okay. That's the outside section is your, your uh, serosa. Okay, so the mucosa. Inner lining of that digestive tract. Okay. Excuse me, this is a mucous membrane. The oral cavity and esophagus are lined with non keratinized stratified squamous cells. Okay. So non keratinized, you don't care on it, but it's stratified, which means what? Multiple layers. More than one layer, multiple layers. Perfect. And squamous means flat. The flat cells, multiple layers of them built up. So it helps with resist stress and abrasion. Okay, oral cavity esophagus, that's where the food comes down, everything gets traumatized. 
bulks of food, parts of food, parts of bones, chips, the things that go in there. Okay, it helps it helps protect the lining. So your oral cavity and, esoph and esophagus are non-keratinized stratified squamous epithelium. Your stomach, small intestine, large intestine, they're simple columnar cells. Simple means one layer. That's because that's where all your absorption is. All your absorption, most of your absorption occurs in the small intestine and some in the large intestine. So it's simple columnar epithelium. They can secrete enzymes, acids, enzymes and, and products into the intestines and they can absorb through a single layer. So it's stratified in the oral cavity and esophagus, single layer in the small intestine, stomach and large intestine because of secretion and absorption. Okay, the mucosa of the small intestine has many folds in it. These folds, like anything else, if you have multiple folds, it increases surface area. You increase surface area, you have a larger area for absorption. Okay. And these little folds are called plica. Okay. Plica increases surface area for increased absorption. And that's in the small intestine because that's where most resorption occurs. The lamina propria underneath the, the, the mucosa contains your blood vessels, your nerves, your smooth muscles, and your lymphatic system. Remember, blood vessels, arteries, and veins, nerves, lymphatic, lymphatic vessels all run together. And your smooth muscles in that layer. So here's your mucosa, and this is a plica. This whole structure right here is a plica. Inside the plica is your arteries, your nerves, your veins, and your lymphatic tissue. Okay, you can see all the different plicas right here, lining up the mucosa. And what it does is it increases your surface area and allows for more secretion and absorption. Some mucosa, below the mucosa. This surrounds your, you know, the muscularis mucosa. The large blood vessels and lymphatics are in this layer. Okay, so your large blood vessels and lymphatic vessels, your larger ones are in the submucosa. The very small ones go into the plica, into the mucosa layer. The submucosal plexus innervates the mucosa. Okay, that's what sends the arteries and nerves and everything up into the plica, into your mucus, you know, into your mucosa. Okay, so it has sensory neurons, parasympathetic and sympathetic. Okay. Which one of these two, the parasympathetic or the sympathetic, trigger digestion? Which one of those gangs are going to be active when you have digestion going on? Sympathetic. No, sympathetic is your fight or flight. Ah, yes. That's your energy one. That's everything that comes out. Your digestive system shuts down. All the energy goes to your muscles and get ready to fight. So your parasympathetic is when digestive is active. That's when it gets stimulated when you're relaxed, you're not worried about anything, and it's food can digest. Okay, so that was your mucosa was the inside, and then that was the submucosa. That's where the larger arteries, veins, lymphatic tissues are all located. The muscularis externa is the next layer. This one surrounds the submucosa. It's dominated by smooth muscle fibers. And that's what allows the intestines to contract. It forms sphincters and valves. A sphincter is what kind of muscle? Sphincters are? Circular. Circular, perfect. That's your sphincter muscle. It closes off or it opens up and allows food to pass or closes and prevents the passing. That's what forms your sphincters, your submucosa fibers, the smooth muscle of the muscularis externa. It's integrated with my enteric pl uh, plexus. That's your parasympathetic ganglion and sympathetic ganglion. Those control the opening and closing of these sphincters or valves to allow you to digest or stop digestion. Again, the parasympathetic allows opening up and the food to flow in and digestion to occur. Sympathetic shuts those, shuts those muscles down so all the energy can go to the rest of your body getting ready to fight, to fight or flee. Okay, so there's a muscularis eterna that surrounds the submucosa and the mucosa. And you've got circular muscles and you've got longitudinal muscles. So it goes in all different directions. You have a three-dimensional contraction. So it contracts not just one direction, but multiple directions. So it can control the food. The serosa is a very outside, the externa. Okay? It's the outermost layer of the digestive system. That is a serosa. 
Okay, and here's your serosa. This is your outer layer right here. All right, muscularis layers and movement of dense material. We have to move food or material or what we take it in as food through digestive tract. So the digestive tract has smooth muscle which propels the food along. Okay, there's two types of muscle activity which we use. Okay, it consists of smooth muscle and we have what's called pacemaker cells. They produce two types of muscle contractions, these pacemaker cells, just like in the heart. You have pacemaker so everything beats together. You have to do the same thing in the intestine. You have to coordinate the contraction so food moves in the right direction. You got to push it along the tracks. You have to have a coordinated movement of cells to contract at the same time. That's the responsibility of the pacemaker cells, just like in the heart. Okay. And there's two types of muscle contractions. There's peristalsis. Peristalsis pushes food through the digestive tract, pushes it along. Segmentation stops the pushing and grinds and mushes it all together. So it helps, modify, helps digest the food. So it puts it, it segments it and then churns it over and over, reads the digestive enzymes, so it breaks it down even further. So peristalsis muscles move it along the tract. Segmentation muscles keep it in one area and turn it over and over and over to kind of uh, churn it up. Okay. So they move the peristalsis, like we said, peristalsis propels material through the digestive tract. Segmentation, it's churned and fragmented at the same time as propelled through the tract by the peristaltic contraction. So it isolates it, turns it up, and then pushes it through peristaltic action. They work in conjunction with each other through these pacemaker cells. Okay, so this is peristalsis. This is your bolus of food. The muscle contracts behind here and it pushes that direction. So as the muscle contracts, the next one contracts, next one contracts, next one contracts, and it pushes this food along through the digestive tract. That's peristalsis. Okay, the movement of food through the digestive tract or your bolus of whatever material you've eaten. Segmentation is a little bit different. Segmentation is where you seal off each branch into smaller and smaller segments. Okay, and in these segments, once you've got these segments here, they start to spin. Like a, like a, little, like a, like a, a cycle for a drying machine. It, it spins and allows the material to churn. Okay. So there's no net movement in any particular direction during segmentation. Once it's done, these open up and then peristalsis come in and push the material. Okay. So segmentation groups off each block of the bolus, makes it smaller, 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 and then churns it around, breaking it up with more enzymes and then pushes it on when it's done. So those are the two types of movement of the, of the digestive tract. All right, let's do, let's probably go another 15, 20 minutes and then we'll call it quits, all right? Let you guys go early because this is our lecture for Wednesday also. So we're doing really well, we'll get done early in a couple of days and get people all set. Like I said, we're ahead of schedule, we're doing really good. So the peritoneum, okay, the serosa, the outside layer is continuous with the parietal Peritoneum. Remember, you have two types of peritoneum. You have visceral and parietal. The parietal is the outside layer. The visceral is the inside layer. Like you take a balloon, punch your hand through the balloon. There's two layers of that balloon around your fist. The inner layer touching your fist is the visceral. The outer of that balloon is the parietal. So the peritone, the serosa is your visceral peritoneum. Continues with the parietal peritoneum. The abdominal organs lie in the peritoneal cavity or in the abdominal cavity. Depends what organ it is. You have intraperitoneal within the peritoneum. You have retroperitoneal behind it. Then you got secondarily retroperitoneal organs that develop. So your intraperitoneal organs are organs that lie within the peritoneal cavity in the cells. They're completely surrounded by the visceral peritoneum, the inside layer. This is your stomach, your liver, and the ileum. The ileum is the second part, the third part of your small intestine. The small intestine goes through duodenum, jejunum, and then the ileum, okay? So this is part of your small intestine, the end part. And it's the ileum, it's a, it's, it's a cap, it's I-L-E-U-M, and it looks like two L's, but it's capital I, it's I-L-E-U-M, okay? The retroperitoneal, organs that are covered by the visceral peritoneum on their anterior surface, but they lie outside the visceral peritoneum. So they lie outside of that visceral, that visceral layer. Okay, and those are your kidneys, 
your ureters and the abdominal aorta. Remember, the aorta becomes the abdominal aorta once it passes the diaphragm. The aorta went from the ascending aorta, aortic arch, descending aorta, thoracic aorta, passes the diaphragm, it becomes the abdominal aorta. Okay. And secondary retroperitoneal organs. Okay, these organs form as interperitoneal, but become retroperitoneal as embryolog embryonic embryological development occurs. Okay, so the change occurs during embry embryonic development, and the visceral peritoneum fuses with the opposing parietal peritoneum, and these become retroperitoneal. So they start off as interperitoneal, then during embryological development, they seal around and become retroperitoneal. So these are called secondarily retroperitoneal organs, and these are your pancreas and your duodenum. The duodenum is the first part of your small intestine. Like I said, you have your duodenum, your jejunum, and your ileum. Those three divisions of your small intestine. And we'll go through those. Mesenteries are these peritoneal sheets of membranes that help hold the organs in place and isolate everything and stabilize it. You have different types of mesentery. They're, uh, they're double sheets of the peritoneal membrane that become fused. So they, they stabilize the position of the organs, hold everything in place. They stabilize the position of the blood vessels. And they provide attachment to the blood vessels going to and from the small intestine. Again, the small intestine is where all your absorption occurs. So it's really important those blood vessels stay in contact with that small intestine. Okay, that's the only way you're going to get nutrients in your body. And this, this, uh, this peritoneal membrane, this meso uh, mesenteries, adhere to that and they form this big groping layer of fat and connective tissue and hold everything in place, hold everything close together. Okay. So the mesenteries, so all but your duodenum is suspended in a sheet of mesentery called your mesentery proper. Okay. The mesocolon is mesentery that's attached to the large intestine. Transverse mesocolon is attached to the transverse colon. And the sigmoid, you can guess, is attached to the sigmoid colon. Okay. Those are the nasal as they attach to it. You also have fusion fascia. Fusion fascia is where it's fused up, attached to the colon, attaches to the ascending colon, the descending colon, the rectum. Okay, those all attach to the posterior abdominal wall with this mesentery. They hold, they hold the ascending, descending, and the rectum to that posterior wall through this fusion fascia. And they have two types of omentum, and these are attached to your stomach. Okay, remember the stomach sits like this as it comes down, and it comes down like that. Okay. And they, this is your esophagus coming in, and then this goes into the, the duodenum, the small intestine, okay? You have a small curvature here, and you have a large curvature here. And that's where you get the names of the lesser and greater omentum. So the lesser omentum is attached to this lesser curve, okay? The greater omentum is attached to this greater curvature of the stomach. So the lesser omentum lies between the stomach and the liver, attached to that smaller curve. The greater omentum extends from the stomach and covers all the abdominal organs on the anterior surface. So that's what lesser and greater means. It's just where the omentum is attached to the lesser curve or the greater curve of the stomach. All right, so now we're starting to look at some of the areas. So here's your lesser omentum, okay? And again, this is the lesser curvature of the stomach. Their picture is a little bit better than mine. And this is the greater curvature of the stomach, okay? And this is where the greater omentum is attached. And this greater omentum slings down and covers all this area. And this covers between the stomach and the liver into there. Okay, this is a mesentery proper as it attaches. And this is a fusion fascia, okay? Attaches the ascending colon, the descending colon, and the rectum to the posterior wall of the abdominal cavity. And then you have your transverse mesocolon attached to your transverse colon right there. So looking at a side view, okay, you can see the lesser omentum, which is attached, it's kind of hard to picture it, but you know that's attached to the lesser curvature of the stomach. And below that is your greater omentum, attached to the greater curvature. You can see this, the lesser omentum isolates between the stomach and the liver and helps secure that area. And this greater omentum goes through this whole area and attaches all those anterior organs into the body and holds everything together. And then you can see the sigmoid colon and then the mesentery proper behind that. Starts within the oral cavity. You have the tongue, you have the uvula, 
the palatal glossal arches, salivary glands, and the teeth. I thought it was the dangly thing in the back of your throat. That's right. That's what it's called, <laughs> a dangly thing. <laughs> That's the most <laughs> So anatomy of it, the lining of the oral mucosa is non-keratinized stratified squamous cells. Again, stratified is multiple layers, more than one, and it's stratified and squished. That's because it is an area where lots of trauma occurs. You put a lot of things in your mouth. Okay? You chew on things and it just protects your oral mucosa. Okay? The oral mucosa is continuous, the lining of your cheeks forms a buccal vestibule. And it comes up with the cheeks, lining of your lips, and lining of the gum. It's all continuous. Okay, the roof of the oral cavity consists of the hard palate. The hard palate is bone. It's the palatine process of the maxilla and the palatine bone. It separates the oral cavity from the nasal cavity. Okay, if you have to have dental work done and you have to get an injection into the hard palate, it's going to hurt. I don't care how good you are it's going to hurt. There's no soft tissue there. You got to squeeze anesthetic into it. That's, I mean, there, there's tricks you can do, but what I do is I take a mirror and I press as hard as I can into the palate and I slide the needle on the mirror so it's in the pressurized spot so it doesn't hurt as bad, but you're still going to feel it. Most injections, again, you never, people never even feel them. Okay, but this one, hard palate, it's just, it's just bone and mucosa. That's it. And there's no room for injection there. The soft palate is distal to the hard palate. That separates the oral cavity from the nasal pharynx. Okay. It makes it the palatal glossal arch, the palatal pharyngeal arch, and the little dangly thing. <laughs> okay. The floor of that cavity. The floor of that cavity is your tongue. That's what consists of the floor of the cavity. The tongue is one of the strongest muscles in the human body. It's extremely strong. Okay, so the oral cavity houses the palatine tonsils. They lie between the palatoglossal arches and the palatopharyngeal arches. They are lateral to the side of the little dangly thing, the uvula. <laughs> That's where they exist. Okay, and here you have your perfect picture of the little dangly thing. That's your uvula. Hangs down in the box there. All right, so here's your hard palate. This is the anterior section. Here's your soft palate. Okay. Hard palate is bone, soft palate is, is mucosa, okay? You have frenums. Frenums are your attachments, where it attaches between the lips. You'll see if you pull your lips out, you'll see little uh, like towers of tissue that go, go here. Those are your frenum. You see the pharyngeal arches. You have your palatal pharyngeal arch and your palatal pharyngeal arch. In between those is your palatine tonsils. Those are usually what gets infected when you get sick. When you look, look at the back of your mouth, you'll see white discharge from those areas. That's your penalty for the infection. They use to take those out routinely. They still will take them out if you have continuous infections there or if they get large enough that they start to block the oral cavity. If your child snores, there's a real good chance these penalty and cons are being inflamed and they need to come out because that's obstructing their airway. So that's something you always check. When, they get, when they're large enough to obstruct the airway and cause a sleep disorder, okay, they need to be taken out. Now we leave them in because they form what's called the, the ring of Willis, which is the other palatines in the mouth and they absorb and they catch bacteria before they get into your respiratory tract. So you don't get respiratory infections down deep in your lungs. So they do have a good function, but if they start blocking the airway, they do need to come out. You have maxillary freedom, you have a lingual freedom, same thing that can, that can attach it to the tissue. All right, uh, mid sagittal section of it. Again, this is a palatal pharyngeal arch right there, that's where your palatine tons are located. This is the tongue, this whole muscle is your tongue. That's the floor of the mouth, huge muscle, very powerful muscle, okay? This is your laryngopharynx as it opens up into the trachea. This is the epiglottis. Remember the epiglottis folds over the trachea here, okay? This comes down and seals that tube. So when you swallow, this is your food coming down, food goes back here and it goes past here into the esophagus, okay? Because it passes over the trachea. These are your lingual tonsils. Like I said, if they get large enough, then they have to be taken out to block the airway. Palatal pharyngeal arch, here's your palatine tonsils. Like I said, if they get large enough, they do need to be removed. 
And then this is the dangly thing. This is the uvula. The nasal pharynx, the auditory tube. This is where you equalize the pressure in your ear. The palatal pharyngeal tube comes from the, the tympanic membrane. And the pharyngeal tonsils up behind the soft palate. All right, so the tongue. The tongue has lots of functions, okay? Manipulation of food, moves food around your mouth so you know where it is. Sensory analysis, it tells you what you're eating. It tells you if you wanna spit it out or not, okay? If it tastes good, tastes bad. Secretion of enzymes to aid in fat digestion, breakdown of lipids. And movement for the formulation of certain words. You move your tongue to make certain words. Okay, the tongue can be divided into different areas. Combined into a body, the root, and the dorsum. The body is the anterior portion of your tongue. When you stick out your tongue, that's the body of your tongue. The root is the back, the posterior portion of the tongue. The dorsum is the stuff that anchors that into the floor of the mouth. It's the superior portion of the tongue, contains a papilla, and the, the papilla contain your taste buds. So that's the dorsum side of the tongue. So here's the dorsum of the tongue, this whole surface that contains all your taste buds. Okay, this is the body of the tongue, and this is the root of the tongue. Okay. There's glands that are embedded in the tongue that aid in the breakdown of fat. Okay, these are embedded glands release lingual lipase. ASC means an enzyme, and then the word preceding it tells you what it breaks down. LIP stands for lipids, which are fats. So lipase breaks down fats. Lingual means it comes from the tongue. So this begins the digestion of fats in the body from this lingual lipase that's released by the tongue. The lingual freedom holds the tongue to the root floor of the mouth. Thin fold of the mucous membrane attached to the tongue to the floor of the mouth. When you have what's called ankyloglossia. Ankyloglossia is when that freedom that connects your tongue extends forward and actually goes to the tip of the tongue so the tongue can't extend out of your mouth. Okay, that's a short lingual freedom. And there's lots of reasons you want your tongue to extend out of your mouth. There's obvious reasons. And there's also licking ice cream, <laughs> licking ice cream cones, things like that when you're eating. But your tongue has a lot of functions besides just digestion. Okay, and you want to be able to stick it out of, you want to get it out of your mouth. Okay, we'll leave it at that. Okay, but this is tongue tie. This is your lingual freedom. Again, you have freedom up here that connects the top and the bottom lips too, but you have one under your tongue. And if this freedom extends to the tip, this tongue, this pulls it down and you cannot push your tongue out of your mouth. And it's a, it's a big problem. I mean, it's a big problem for adults, but it's a, it's a big problem for infants also. Infants can't suck. My new, gran, uh, my new grandbaby that we went to see had to have surgery. She's at six weeks old because her tongue was tongue tied and she couldn't suck, she couldn't attach to the breast. So they did that 100% improvement once they cut it. And it, it's so easy to do nowadays. We, it used to be, it used to be a, a incision, they called it a Z incision, and they, they put a stitch here, stitch here, and stitch here to hold it together. They cut like a Z shape. Now you just take a laser. You take a laser, it just goes like that. No bleeding, cauterizer when you cut it, great to use. It's, these phrenectomies are so easy with a laser and so le tr less traumatic than they used to be. But that's tongue tight. And you can see this is a kid, a child, a young child. And you can see they're not, they're not using their teeth. See these grooves here? These are called enamelons. And what happens is as you as you use your teeth, they grind them down. That's where your teeth are flat now. Because these these are these are the developmental lobes of the teeth. Everybody's born, they're used to cut through the gum as the teeth come in. Everybody has them. They cut through the gums, they're sharp. Okay. And as you use your teeth, they wear down, your teeth become flat. And you can see them up here too. You can see little ones up here. So these teeth are not coming into contact. So they're not using their tongue. It's inhibiting it from doing that. So the enamels aren't being smoothed down. Okay. That's tongue tight. That's a severe case of tongue tight. That should never have gotten to this older patient. I mean, it's still a kid. You can see a primary molar here, but these are permanent teeth right here. That's permanent dentition. So you're talking nine, 10, 11 years old. But they should never got to this point because this is the tip of the tongue. And the tip of the tongue, if that frame is attached right there, you, you can't talk. You have difficulty eating, difficulty swallowing. And there's other things you want to do as an adult with your tongue. You want that clipped. <laughs> okay? And it's very simple. You take a laser, 
and you go like that, and that's it. It's such a lot of times you don't need the anesthetic. Just take the laser, it cuts, cauterizes, seals off the nerves, and everything. It's very easily done. The tongue consists of two muscles. There's intrinsic muscles and there's extrinsic tongue muscles. Just like in the hand, you have intrinsic and extrinsic muscles and the same functions. Intrinsic muscles, you have very fine control. They alter the shape of your tongue. You can make a U, you can make an S, you can twist it around. They, they shape the tongue. Your extrinsic muscles are your force, your gross movements, right? Like the hyoglossus muscle, the styloglossus muscle, the genioglossus, and the powderglossus muscle. Okay, so it's the same situation as the hand is. Both sets of muscles of the intrinsic and the extrinsic are controlled by the, the 12th cranial nerve, the hypoglossal nerve. <coughs> okay. okay, if you look at the different muscles of the tongue, this is the mandible, it's cut away here. You see how it's cut through there. This is your styloid process. Remember, that's just anterior to the uh, mastoid process on the skull. Styloid process is just inferior to this opening here, which is the external acoustic meatus for your ear, ear, your eardrum. Okay, so muscle of the tongue, you can see the palatal glossus, which runs up here and reaches to the, to the palate. The styloglossus, which runs to the st uh, styloid process. The genioglossus, runs to the genial, high, the genial uh, tubercle, the high bone. And the hyoglossus, which runs to the hyoid bone, which is your free, float, free floating bone underneath or inferior to the mandible. So those are the muscles of the tongue. Now in doing dentistry, we get all kinds of fun things with the tongue. We get all kinds of tongue rings and tongue rings are, I'm not gonna say they're bad, but they can be, they can cause pathology. I see a lot of broken teeth with tongue rings. I've seen several broken teeth, I've seen infections. If you do have a tongue ring, Make sure you take it out every night and rinse with uh, some kind of mouthwash to keep that plant because that lingual, that lingual tissue that's exposed there can become infected really easily. I'll show you some pictures of it when it gets infected. Okay. And then some people kind of go a little overboard and we'll get three in a row there. Okay. And some people go put a little diamond shape, they have little pyramid shapes. We get all kinds of funny things at the office and some people go absolutely nuts and they put piercings everywhere. Now I would imagine that, that would be hard to talk and hard to eat. Just gut feel tells me that. Okay. This was a new one too. I had a lady come in with a horizontal tongue ring. Okay. I've never seen that before. They actually pierce the tongue horizontally rather than vertically. This one is guaranteed to break teeth. It has to get your tongue lines on the floor of your mouth on the sides where your teeth come together. And she had four broken teeth from this wall run already. It's, it's, I don't know why they would do this one, but it kind of took me by surprise when I saw that. And that's what an infection looks like. If you let those get infected, that's what that tooth looks like. That lingual tissue flares up tremendously. And those can be very dangerous. So. If you do have a tongue ring, you got to make sure you take those out every night and rinse it and then put it back in because they can get infected really easily. He doesn't look like he has good oral hygiene anyway. No, you can see some decay and everything else around there. So, yeah, not a whole lot of good oral hygiene right there. Although that doesn't look too terrible, but, you know, you just, just got to make sure if you have them, make sure you rinse them, keep them clean. We did have one lady that... Um, you know, you, you play with it, you put it in and out of your mouth. She was taking off a wool sweater and she grabbed her sweater and pulled it off and was playing with the tongue ring and it caught on the sweater as she pulled the tongue over her head. And it literally ripped the tongue ring straight forward and ripped right through the tongue. And it's a lot to sew back up because tongue is a lot of strong muscles. That took a long time to sew her back up. And she did not do make that mistake again. But yeah, but if you haven't, just be careful with them. All right, salivary glands. There's three pairs of salivary glands in the oral cavity. There's the parotid gland, the sublingual, and the submandibular. Okay. All three produce salivary amylase, which is an enzyme that starts to digest carbohydrates, starts to break them down. So that's the first step of the digestive process 
when food enters the mouth. Okay, the parotid gland. Okay, the parotid gland is the largest of those salivary glands. That's the biggest one. It's on the lateral side of the face, in the area of the ramus of the mandible, just above the ramus. Enzymes drain to the mouth by the parotid duct. So the parotid gland sits on the side by the ramus, glands in just outside, enters just uh, just buckled to the, the second molar. And that's where it drains into the mouth. That's where the parotid duct enters into the oral cavity. And it lies on the masseter muscle. So remember the masseter muscle is the main muscle of mastication. Okay, but yeah, the masseter muscle and the temporalis muscle. All right. So here's your parotid gland. So it's just over the ramus of the mandible. Remember the ramus is the part that extends upward. Okay, this is the parotid duct. Comes in, opens the oral cavity, and comes in right adjacent to the second molar. Okay. This is a subling uh, sublingual gland below the tongue. And you can see the sublingual ducts here. You ever lift your tongue and have it squirt out fluid? You see it all the time. Okay. When that happens, that's the sublingual gland releasing uh, amylase. Then you have your submandibular gland that sits below the mandible. And you have a submandibular duct that enters under the tongue. Okay. And these are all paired glands. There's one on each side. There's a right and left. So parotid gland, sublingual gland, submandibular gland. Okay. Those are all your salivary glands in the head and neck. And this muscle right here, What's that muscle right there? Your masticator. That's the masseter, perfect. That's your master muscle that slams the jaw shut and allows you to close. It allows the force of a contraction when the jaw closes. Okay. The sublingual gland, okay, the sublingual salivary glands are below the tongue. They cover the mucous membrane of the floor of the mouth. There's numerous sublingual ducts then open along sides of the lingual, fra uh, lingual frenulum. Okay, the lingual frenum that goes right under the tongue. Then you got the submandibular gland, which is located on the floor of the mouth under the mandible. Okay, it's deep in the mandible and it's inferior to the myelohyoid line of the mandible. That's that line that runs around the, 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 the body of the, of the mandible. You have submandibular ducts open posterior to the mandibular teeth. That's why when you're going for a teeth cleaning, one of the things that builds up is behind your lower front teeth. That's where calculus builds up. We see that all the time. That's where most people have it building up. That's because that's where the submandibular glands at exit. And that causes calculus to build up in those areas from the enzymes and the calcium deposits in that area. So that's where you see most of our buildup is in the posterior of the lower anterior teeth. And again, so it this the submandibular gland enters right below those lower teeth right there. So the parotid gland, submandibular gland, and sublingual glands are your three salivary glands. Okay, so what, what is saliva? How do we control it? It's regulated by your autonomic nervous system. Remember, there's two autonomic nervous systems. There's parasympathetic and there's sympathetic. And there's sympathetic is your fight or flight response. Parasympathetic is your relaxation, kicking back. So parasympathetic accelerates salivary secretions because you're increasing digestion. You're relaxing, you're digesting the food that you've been taking. Sympathetic reduces salivary secretion. Your energy is going elsewhere. Can help get the help get the body ready for a fight or flight situation. Okay. The teeth. The teeth are designed for chewing, for mastication. Every tooth has each of those following there. It has a crown, a neck, a root. It has dentin under the enamel. It has a pulp cavity where the nerve of the tooth is. There's a root canal where the nerve runs inside the tooth. There's an apical foramen. Foramen just means op opening. Apical is at the bottom of the tooth. There's an opening where the nerve and blood vessels enter into the tooth. And the periodontal ligament is what anchors the teeth to the socket, to the sulcus around the, around the, the bony structure of the mandible. Okay, so the crown of the tooth is what sticks above the, bump, the gum, the gingiva. 
It's covered by enamel. And underneath the enamel layer, enamel is about one and a half millimeters thick. Under that layer is dentin. Dentin is not as strong as enamel, it's weaker. That's why when decay enters a tooth, if this is your tooth, and even though I'm dealing with teeth all day long, I still can't draw them. This is your tooth here as it comes down. This is all, this is all under the bone. This is your enamel. Under your enamel, there's another layer. This is dentin. Okay. Enamel is very hard, very dense. So when you get decay, it travels through the enamel, but it travels more or less in a straight line. Okay, it doesn't spread out because enamel is so thick and tough. It just goes through. Once it then it spreads. Okay, it starts to spread out, and it starts to spread through the tooth. Okay, so that's what you see on an X-ray. You'll see a little bit of trine on there, and once it hits this, then you have to take it out with a with a drill. You have to uh, take the cavity out. If it's still in the enamel, it can remineralize with fluoride and stuff like that. But enamel is very thick. Your dentin is your thin substance. Okay. Inside the dentin is your pulp. Runs inside the dentin. The pulp is where all your blood vessels run, your arteries, your, your arteries, veins, your nerves. Run inside the pulp of the tooth. And it goes through the apical foramen. This is the apical foramen. At the bottom of the teeth, there's an opening right here where all your nerves and blood vessels enter into the tooth. Okay, this is the neck of the tooth right here. And then the root is the lower part underneath the, inside the bone. Okay. So you have the enamel on the outside, which is a very, uh, inor uh, very inorganic matrix. It's very hard, very dense, denser than bone. The dentin is inside the enamel. It's a mineralized matrix. It's different than bone. It does not contain any cells. So it's a lot denser than bone, but it's not as dense as enamel. The pulp cavity is the area inside the tooth that has the nerves and the blood vessels. It's a spongy area. It's very highly vascularized. So teeth do bleed if you cut into them. They have nerves and they have arteries and veins inside of them. The root canal of the, of the root, the arteries and veins and nerves pass through the root, through the apical foramen into the pulp cavity area. So the apical frame is the opening at the distal end of the root canal. The periodontal ligament, like I said, anchors the root of the tooth to the alveolar socket of the mandible or the maxilla. The articulation is a gomphosis, which is an immovable articulation. Just like the interosseous membranes of the radius and the ulnar or the tibia and the fibula. Those interosseous membranes, those are gomphosis. They're immovable articulation, articulation joints. Okay. So here's a summary. This is a much better picture than I drew. Okay. You can see your enamel, which is this white layer out here. You see the dentin, which is that yellow layer inside of here. Underneath the dentin is your pulp cavity. That's where your nerves, your, your nerve, your artery, your veins all come inside the tooth. Okay. So if the decay travels, from this through the den, okay? If it hits that nerve, that tooth's gonna bleed, okay? Because there's blood vessels there. Once it hits that nerve, it builds up an infection. That infection travels th through the blood vessels to the bottom of the tooth here, and it starts to eat away the bone at the bottom of that root. That's what's called an abscess. You can see that on x-ray, because it's clear because the bone's being dissolved when that starts to go. Then this is the cementum lines the root. This is the layer of the outside here that lines the root of the tooth. And you see the periodontal ligament are these fibers that hold the tooth together. So the tooth is not connected directly to bone. It's not fused to bone. If it was, you couldn't move it with braces. Okay, you got to have some leeway or some give for orthodontics to work. It has to put pressure on the periodontal ligament and that dissolves the bone as it moves away. And as it moves, it, say the tooth is moving this direction, it dissolves the periodontal ligament, the dissolved bone moves here, and as it goes this way, more bone fills in behind it. That allows the tooth to move. If the tooth was anchored to bone, it could not move with orthodontic force. An implant, when we put an implant in the mouth, that's anchored directly to bone. That's not going to move. You cannot move that with orthodontics or any other force. It's part of the bone. It's what's called osseous integration. It integrates directly into the bone. So the periodontal ligament is the reason 
we can have braces that actually move teeth through the mouth. You can see the root canal, the alveolar bone, the avicular foramen, and this is where the nerves enter and the blood vessels enter at the avicular foramen down here on the bottom of the tooth. And depending what root it, what tooth it is, depends how many roots it has. Teeth are designed to chew with. There's four incisors, there's two cuspids, there's four bicuspids, and there's four to six molars per, per every arch. That gives you a maximum of 32 teeth per arch, including wisdom teeth. This is roughly when teeth start to come in. Okay, this varies tremendously from kid from child to child, but your central incisors on the top usually come in between seven to eight years old. Central incisors on the bottom usually come in at six to seven years old. Those are usually the first teeth that you see coming in when you have a child. Now I've seen kids as early as four get the permanent teeth, and I see them come in as late as ten. So there's just guidelines. There's nothing. There's nothing wrong with it coming later. In fact, the later the better, because they have better oral habits the older they get. So I mean, no hurry for kids to get their, their, their teeth in, but usually around six years old, we start seeing these lower teeth starting to come in, okay? And then your, your first molars come in about six years old, uh, second molars come in about 12 years old, and wisdom teeth come in anywhere from 18 to 20 years old. That's why they're called wisdom teeth. You're supposed to be wise by that age. Uh, usually not. <laughs> and the molars here, the, the first year molars, same molars, the wisdom teeth, those molars have no baby teeth to precursor them. In other words, you only have 20 baby teeth. The baby teeth extend from cent in sizes to bicuspids. Okay? These are your baby teeth right here. They don't include the back molars. So when molars come in, there's no baby teeth to guide them. There's nothing in front of them. They just come in on their own. They don't have baby teeth in front of them. So you don't lose baby teeth when those come in. Okay, and that's what they look like. On the top teeth, these are your incisors. They're a little bit wider. Canines, bicuspids, and then your molars. Molars are for chewing. Incisors are for tearing, biting into things. Bicuspids and molars are designed with a flatter surface for chewing and extra roots to help like increase stability when you're chewing for the chewing forces. Most of your chewing force is right in this area. That's where you, that's where most decay occurs on kids because that's where all the chewing occurs. That's where all your force is. And like I said, the average person can bite without 300 PSI pounds per square inch, which is a tremendous amount of force. Don't want you to get your hand in between there. So you were saying that with dentures, it's only like, like five or something like that? Five. Yeah. The average person bites at 300 PSI the average dental wear bites with five. Now with implants, does that differ? Yes. It's in the, okay. Tremendously, you're right. With implants, because what happens is teeth are anchored into bone. So when you bite, you have all that bone to support them. And you can put force. When you have a, when you have a denture, you have this piece of plastic that's laying on top of soft tissue. There's nothing going into bone. So when you bite, it just presses on soft tissue. So it gives. So all the force can go on the compression of the soft tissue. Okay, now when you have an implant, that goes back into the bone. So with an implant, you can bite with a pretty much the, almost the same force you can with a, with a healthy set of teeth. Because the implant gives you that anchoring support. Now there's different designs you can do. You can put, you can put a denture over implants, which helps you chew a little better, or you can put each individual tooth and replace it with implants. Okay? It's just cost-wise, it makes a big difference. Because implants are not cheap. I mean, if you want to do implants for every single tooth, replace every tooth with an implant, you're probably looking at over $80,000 to fix your mouth. Okay, it, it's not cheap at all. Individual implants with dentures to go over them, you're looking anywhere about ten to 15000 But it makes a difference. It makes a big difference. Because first of all, with a, like an upper denture, it covers the whole roof of your mouth. It covers a lot of taste buds. With implants, you can cut that all back open again. Because you don't have you don't need the roof of the mouth to support it. You got the implants to support it. It's all implants support it. So you can chew better and you can taste better. So a lot of people do that option because it's 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 it makes a big difference, it makes a huge difference. Does that make sense? 
Yes, thank you. Oh, no problem. <clears throat> okay, so you have two sets of teeth in your life. Every once in a while, you get three. I mean, some kids are born with teeth. And mothers know that as soon as they start to breastfeed. Okay, Some kids are born with a, a third set of teeth. They come in, they're called neonatal teeth. They don't develop their teeth, but they're not, they don't take the form of teeth. They're just calcified structures. So they're called neonatal teeth. And they fall out real early. But everybody usually has two sets, deciduous teeth, which are baby teeth, and permanent teeth, which are adult teeth. Deciduous teeth are 20. There are no molars. Okay? Permanent teeth are 32 if, if you get all four wisdom teeth. Now, more and more people are not getting wisdom teeth anymore. Our diets are a lot softer. We're not chewing as hard. We're not utilizing our jaw muscles. So over evolution through time, we're not developing wisdom teeth. So I've got a lot of patients right now who just don't have any wisdom teeth. They just think they're on top of the evolutionary scale. <laughs> okay. But we're seeing less and less wisdom teeth as, as we're going through here. We're not using our jaws as much because we we're cooking our food, making it more tender. All right. So you have deciduous teeth and you have permanent teeth. Again, that's just the same chart we looked at before. Different uh, deciduous teeth that they come in. There's your 20 deciduous teeth. Again, permanent molars are not counted for that. The, the where you have your deciduous second molars, for example, here, where you have these deciduous molars, these are where your bicuspids come in. Okay, and then the molars come in back here. Okay, so the molars have no precursor primary teeth to them. And this is your permanent teeth. Again, this is 32 teeth if you count all four wisdom teeth. Okay, when you talk about teeth, it's about structures. You talk about how you reference it. You can have different surfaces of the teeth. The buccal surface of the tooth is close to the buccal of your muscle, which is your, your cheek. Okay, That's called the buccal surface. The surface by the tongue is called the lingual surface or the palatal surface. So you have buccal and lingual, and you have mesial and distal. So you have a midline. If the surface is towards the midline, it's mesial, like every other part of the body. If the surface of the tooth is away from the midline, it's distal. And occlusal surface is the part that chews, the grinding part. That's the part that meets the opposing surface and masticates your food. So you got buccal lingual, mesial distal, and occlusal. You got five surfaces. Because the sixth surface is where? Six surfaces under the gum and in the bone. So you got five surfaces exposed, four around the edge and then the top. That's your buccal lingual, mesial distal, and occlusal. Pharynx is a back area that connects the mouth to the esophagus. That's your pharynx. Serves as a passageway for food, liquid, and air. Pharyngeal muscles are involved in swallowing. They force the food from the oral cavity down towards the esophagus. You have got pharyngeal constrictors. You got the palatal pharyngeus, the stylopharyngeus, and the palatal muscles. Those are the muscles that are involved in swallowing. So on the pharynx, you have pharyngeal constrictors, which push the bolus towards the esophagus. Palatal the palatal pharyngeus from the roof of the mouth elevates the larynx, lifts it up, creates space. The stylopharyngeus also, the, remember the styloid, um, styloid process up high? <clears throat> that muscle is going to contract and it's going to pull the pharynx up. So the palatal pharyngeus and the stylopharyngeus both elevate the larynx. And the palatal muscles raises the soft palate. Maybe you got the hard palate over the palatine bone and the soft palate where the little dangly thing hangs down, <laughs> the little uvula. <laughs> okay, the palatal muscles lift that soft palate up so the bolus can pass past the soft palate because there's, there's no bone holding that. So you have to lift it up out of the way so the food can go down. So that's what those four sets of muscles do. The, the pharyngeal constrictors push the food towards the esophagus. The palatal pharyngeus and the stylopharyngeus elevator lift the larynx and then the palatal muscles lift the soft palate. So everything's clear and the muscle pushes back and food can now go from the oral cavity into the esophagus. That's how the four groups work. Okay. So here's your palatal muscles. Again, the palatal muscles lift the soft palate. Okay. The palatal muscles include the tensor veli palatini and the levator veli palatini. And again, these muscles you see right here and right here, if you see the anchoring points, they anchor the soft palate. As they contract, they're going to push in this direction, right? They're going to lift the soft palate. 
the laryngeal elevators. You can see this is the uh, stylopharyngeus and the palatal pharyngeus. Here's your stylopharyngeus and your palatal pharyngeus. When these contract, they're going to lift the larynx upwards in both angles. One's going to lift distally, one's going to, one's going to lift, I'm sorry, inferior, one's going to lift uh, superiorly to it. Then the pharyngeal constrictors, you have a superior pharyngeal constrictor, a middle, and an inferior. Okay? And those are going to constrict and push the food down the larynx towards the esophagus. Okay? So if you look at the attachment of the muscles, you can see how they work and what function you're going to have. Because you remember, muscles can only do one thing. All they can do is shorten. They can't go sideways. They can't lengthen. All they can do is shorten. So when they, they shorten, they can spit, you can see what action is going to have on the, the parts of the body they're attached to. So the swallowing process, swallowing is process called deglution. De de deglution is your swallowing process. There's feet, feet there's three phases of deglution. Okay? The, there's the buckle phase where the tongue pushes the food toward the oral pharynx area. Remember the oral pharynx is a pharyn pharynx area behind the oral cavity. So the tongue pushes the food back there. That's the buccal phase. The pharyngeal phase, the epiglottis closes. The epiglottis closes, it blocks the opening to the trachea. So now the food cannot go down the trachea, it has to go down the esophagus. There's only two tubes there. You got two openings. If the epiglottis closes over the trachea, there's only one opening left, and that's the esophagus. That's where it has to go down. And that's when swallowing begins. Then you got your esophageal phase where the upper esophageal sphincter muscle opens and begins to move down the, the esophagus. Remember, sphincter is a circular muscle that controls and opens like a valve. Okay? It opens and closes like a valve for the most part. So the upper esophageal sphincter opens it to allow the opening of the esophagus and food to enter into the esophagus. Those are your three phases of deglution. So here's the buccal phase. Okay. You can see the tongue, you can see the bolts of food here being pushed through the oral pharyngeal region behind the behind the oral cavity. Then the pharyngeal phase, the pharyngeal muscles constrict, and they push this move, this bolus of food from the oral cavity towards the esophagus through the pharynx by the pharyngeal constrictors. Okay, then the, the um, esophageal phase, the sphincter muscle opens, and this bolus of food can enter into the esophagus. And it goes from the esophagus all the way down thoracic cavity, and it gets deposited into the stomach. That's how swallowing works. Right? <clears throat> the esophagus itself, the esophagus is a hollow muscular tube that extends from the pharyngeal region to the stomach. So food enters in the pharyngeal and leaves it in the stomach for the esophagus. Okay. It's not a tube that stays open. It's a muscular tube, which is, which is kind of squished when you look at it. It's not a circular tube like the trachea. The trachea stays open because of the cartilaginous rings that keep it open. It cannot collapse. The esophagus can collapse. It's just muscle, and the food is pushed through that muscular tissue. Okay. Whereas your trachea has to remain open for air to flow. Because remember, a bolus, of a bolus of food has a lot of mass to it. It'll force its way through the muscular uh, lining of the esophagus. Air doesn't have that mass. So for air to move, we have to keep it open. We keep it open with those, those uh, cartilaginous rings that keep our trachea open and does not allow it to collapse. So air can tra be transferred. So the esophagus is about 25 centimeters long, about two centimeters in diameter. It's located posterior to the trachea. Okay, Coming from the anterior surface, you have your, your cricothyroid membranes here your thyroid cartilage, you have your trachea, and you have your esophagus. Okay. It enters the per uh, peritoneal cavity, passing through the esophageal hiatus of the diaphragm. So the diaphragm has an opening called the esophageal hiatus, which the esophagus passes through as it goes to the stomach, because the stomach is below the diaphragm. So for the esophagus to get there, it has to pass through the diaphragm, and it does it through the esophageal hiatus. Okay, the esophagus is innervated by the vagus nerve. Okay, cranial nerve number 10. It contains upper and lower esophageal sphincters. Sphincters are circular muscles that control what goes in and what goes out. So when the, the upper esophageal sphincter opens, food can come in. It fills the esophagus 
when the lower esophageal sphincter opens, food goes out into the stomach. So food passes from the pharynx to the esophagus through the upper esophageal sphincter. Food passes from the esophagus to the stomach through the lower esophageal sphincter. Make sense? Cool. No one's arguing something that makes sense. So esophagus, esophagus, its main function is transport material from the oral cavity to the stomach. Okay. In histology of the esophageal wall, what's it made up of? It's the mucosa lining. There's a submucosa. There's a smooth muscle layer. There's a muscular externa. The esophagus does not have a serosa like the other rest of the tract has, like we talked about before. We talked about the lines with having the, the, the mucosa, submucosa, muscular externa, and the serosa. Okay, the esophagus does not have a serosa layer. That's what it looks like on a light microscope. Okay, you see the mucosa, the submucosa, and you see this large muscular layer here, the external mucosa, external mucosa layer. Okay, all this smooth muscle contracts, and that contraction allows the bolus of food to push down through it. And again, this is stratified squamous epithelium. Okay, more than one layer, squish cells flat, help protect it, because everything we eat can irritate or damage the esophagus. If we don't chew it well enough, or just some parts, parts of the food left, that aren't, aren't, aren't broken down enough. That, that tissue, that, that epithelium, helps protect the esophageal layer. All right, your stomach, does, once it gets to the stomach, your stomach does three things. It's the bulk storage of ingested food. Right? When, you, when you ingest food, it gets stored in the stomach. There's no other place for it to go. Okay, that's your storage bin. Okay, so it's the bulk storage of all your ingested food. Get the mechanical breakdown of ingested food. It starts to move. It starts to mechanically disrupt the food and break it down by forcing it against one another by muscular contractions. And you get chemical digestion. Your stomach is a place that starts to release a lot of chemicals. I mean, salivary release amylase and helps break down carbohydrates, but that's what the very beginning happened. But the stomach releases a lot more, okay? So the end result of the storage of the mechanical breakdown and the chemical digestion is what's called chyme. Chyme is the end result of what leaves the stomach. That's the mass, what the mass of bowls of food is called after it's mechanically broken down and the chemical addition has begun. It's called chyme. Okay. In the stomach, the stomach is intraperitoneal. It's part of the peritoneal system. It's in the left hypochondriac epigastric a portion of the upper and left lumbar regions. When you look at the quadrants, the stomach, the anterior section is broken into, those are the sections where the stomach occupies. And that's important in an ER with gunshot wounds, with stabbing wounds. You know which region you're looking at where the, where the entry, entry wound is, you know what damage could be occurring underneath it. Remember the stomach consists of a lesser curvature, which is a smaller part. Remember the stomach, you know, coming out, here's your esophagus, here's your stomach. Okay, and here's your um, duodenum. And this is your esophagus. Okay. Okay, this is a small intestine esophagus. This is the small curvature, the lesser curvature. This is the greater curvature. It's bigger. Okay. This is where the lesser momentum attached to between the stomach and the liver. This is where the greater momentum attached to for the covering all the rest of the interparenting organs. Okay. So the stomach has a lesser curvature, greater curvature, a cardia, a fundus, a body, and a pylorus. The pylorus is the sphincter. I think that the rest of that, okay. These are different quadrants where the stomach can reside. Your hypo, um, hypochondriac region, epigastric region, your right hypochondriac region, umbilical, all depends on where your stomach is going to reside in those different areas. Okay, so you just know the different areas where the entry would occur, so you know what you're looking at being damaged. Okay, in the stomach, chem chemical breakdown of materials, enzymes, acids produced, mechanical breakdown through muscular contractions. So the stomach is three things, you remember? Stores food, mechanical breakdown through the, the contraction of smooth muscles, and enzymatic breakdown, digestion begins to occur with enzymes and acid being released. That's the three functions of the stomach. Okay. 
And here's the different body. This is the part you talked about. Here's the lesser curvature right here. Okay, and this is the lesser momentum. Here's the greater curvature. Okay, here's the pylorus. The pylorus is a sphincter. Pylorus sphincter is a valve that controls when the contents of the stomach are ready to go into the duodenum, which is the first part of the small intestine. So that's called the pylorus. There's a pyloric sphincter there. So the pylorus is the entry point into the small intestine from the stomach. The stomach has a body, has the cardia, which is where the esophagus feeds in, and has a fundus, which is the top part of the stomach. Okay? Those are the main divisions or parts of the stomach. The fundus, the cardia, body, pylorus, greater curvature, lesser curvature. <clears throat> in the stomach, we have what's called gastric rugae. Okay, rugates are folds in the stomach. Now, if you eat a lot, what happens to the stomach? Does it shrink or does it expand? It expands, right? It gets bigger. Okay, everybody knows the Thanksgiving dinner next week. You're gonna take your button, you're gonna unbutton the top button of your pants, right? Because your stomach gets bigger when you eat a lot. You sit back and that's what you do, okay? That's because of the gastric rugae. Gastric rugae are these grooves inside the stomach. And when you have all these little grooves, when she puts pressure on it, these grooves flatten out and they allow the stomach to expand. Okay, that's the reason for unbuckling your belt. Okay, so relaxed stomach, you have these numerous muscular ridges when the stomach's relaxed. You have lots of ridges. The ridges permit expansion of your stomach. A stretched stomach, like at Thanksgiving, less prominent rugae, the rugae are flattened out. Because if you have this area here, this is your stomach when it's relaxed here. Okay, you start to fill it with food, it pushes on here, and it's these, rug these rugae start to flatten out. Okay, that's what they're for. They allow the stomach to expand so it can store food as you eat. Smooth muscle layers around the stomach. You have a circular layer, a longitudinal layer, and oblique muscles. There's three, they're, but all smooth muscles. Okay, every one of those layers are smooth muscles. The circular longitudinal oblique are all smooth muscles. Now, all it is, <laughs> is he, he's waving goodbye to you, right? <laughs> okay, all that is, is you want to contract the stomach so the food is going to go in multiple directions. You're not going to put pressure in one direction. You can put circular, you can put longitudinal, which is nine degrees, and you can put oblique, which is an angles. So when all those muscles contract, the entire stomach starts to contract. So you're, you're contracting in three dimensions. You're not just contracting in one dimension. So you're able to mechanically break down all the food in the stomach very effectively. Okay, So that's why you just don't have one direction of muscles. You have circular, longitudinal, and then oblique. So you're contracting in three dimensions when the stomach contracts those muscles. All right, here's a good picture of rugae. These are all these little grooves. As the stomach fills up, okay, that groove smooth out. It allows the stomach to expand. And these are the muscles, okay? Here's your longitudinal muscles that run along this around the stomach. Here's your circular muscles, which go around the circular area of the stomach. And here's your oblique muscles that run at an angle. So you can see everything's running in three dimensions. So as these muscles contract, it's contracting completely around and is able to churn that food, that chine, over and over to make sure it, it turns over the right area. Okay. And this is the, remember the, the section of the stomach. This is your fundus, which is the top of your stomach. This is the cardia which is the opening where the esophagus is. This is the body, which is the rest of the stomach. This is the pylorus right here, which is your opening to the, uh, the duodenum, your small intestine. And there's a pyloric sphincter, pyloric valve, right near the opening. And then again, your greater curvature and your lesser curvature. No one should miss greater curvature, lesser curvature, right? That one we're gonna rely on, it's, it's greater and it's lesser. All right, so everybody, Expert on the stomach now, right? The mesentery. Mesentery, you have the greater men, lesser men. Again, the greater men is attached to the greater curvature. The lesser men is attached to the lesser curvature. And all the mesentery does is hold all the ornate organs and protect them and hold them in place. It's all this fat and connective tissue that holds your intestines where they're supposed to be. So the mesentery associated with the stomach are called your greater and lesser omenums. And again, obviously the greater curvature and lesser curvature where they're located. So the greater momentum covers the greater curvature of the stomach and drapes across the surface of the small intestine, covers all the small intestine. 
the lesser omentum is between the liver and the stomach. Okay, it extends from the lesser curve of the stomach to the liver, and extends from the pylorus duodenal region to the liver is the hypoduodenal ligament. So it forms two different ligaments, as one forms inferior, one forms superior to it. All right, so this is what, this is what mesen, uh, mesenchyme looks like, mesentery, okay? All this fat and connective tissue that hold together. And again, the lesser curvature, the lesser moment, a uh, lesser, mo uh, lesser mesentery, I'm sorry, a lesser omentum, okay, is between the liver and the stomach. The greater omentum comes from the stomach and covers all the small intestines and holds everything all in place. Blood supply to the stomach. There's three branches for the celiac trunk that supply the stomach. There's the left gastric artery, which supplies blood to the lesser curvature and the cardia. Remember the cardia is the top part, okay? And the part where the, the, the fundus is the top part, the cardia is below that. The cardia is where the esophagus enters the stomach. So if we were to have, this is our esophagus coming down and this is the stomach here as it goes through. Okay, this is the cardia right here. And then this is the fundus. Okay. So it supplies a lesser curvature, which is there, and the fundus, where the esophagus enters. The splenic artery okay, supplies blood to the fundus, the top part of the stomach. It branches to from the less gastroepiloic artery, which supplies the greater curvature. And then you also got the common hepatic artery, which branches to form the right gastric the right gastroepiloic and the gastroduodenal artery that supply the greater and lesser curvatures. Stomach has a large blood supply to it. Okay. So these are the different arteries. Here's the left gastric and here's the splenic branching off of it. Okay. And the get left gastric epiloic artery. You got your right gastroepiloic artery. You got the gastroduodenal. You got your right gastric and you got your common hepatic artery. Okay. All right, the histology of the stomach. The stomach is lined with simple columnar epithelium. Okay. Structures within the lining of the stomach, your gastric pits and your gastric secretory cells secrete things into the stomach. You have mucous neck cells, you have parietal cells, cheap cells, and enteroendocrine cells. And all those have a different function of what they secrete into the stomach. Okay? The gastric pits, these gastric pits are areas between the, the linings that replace the lost stomach cells. Stomach cells get replaced often. It's a very thin lining, it's a simple, uh, simple uh, epithelium, so it's only one layer, and the acids go through that lining. So these cells get replaced on a continuous basis. That's what the gastric pits do. They produce cells that replace the lost stomach cells. Mucus cells produce copious amounts of mucus. This mucus helps protect the stomach from the acid being produced from the acidic content and they line the stomach. The neck cells, the mucus neck cells produce mucus that lubricate the food when it enters the stomach. So the chyme can come around and circulate. The parietal cells, they secrete intrinsic factor and hydrochloric acid, okay? So your parietal cells do two things. You have intrinsic factor and hydrochloric acid. The two intrinsic cells help absorb vitamin B12, okay? From the small intestine into your bloodstream, okay? And it's used during erythropoiesis, the formation of red blood cells. So a lot of physicians, when they have a patient with anemia and they don't, they're not, they're low on vitamin B12, they just give them B12, and if that doesn't work, something else is wrong. A lot don't check for intrinsic factor. The patient can be functioning just fine, have the diet just fine, everything else, but if intrinsic factor is not being produced by the parietal cells, they're not going to absorb the B12. So as a physician or a PN, a, a physician's assistant, okay, you can give a patient all the vitamin B12 injections you want. If they're not producing intrinsic factor, they're not going to absorb it. That's a lot of time that's overlooked on a lot of patients. They just keep upping the dose of B12, the patient keeps getting worse. Hydrochloric acid, 
Hyaluronic acid kills microorganisms in the food that you bring in your stomach, and it activates pepsinogen into pepsin. Okay. So the chief, the chief cells secrete pepsinogen with hydrochloric acid. It gets converted to pepsin. Pepsin starts to break down the amino acid chains, the, the proteins. The enteroendocrine cells, these are cells of the stomach that produce hormones. The G cells produce hormone called gastrin. Gastrin causes your parietal cells and your chief cells to release their products. So they cause the parietal cells to release hydrochloric acid and um, enteric factor and the chief cells to release pepsinogen, which gets converted to pepsin by the hydrochloric acid. You can see the mucal epithelial pits here. This is the entrance to your gastric pits. These are the areas deep down in the canals here. And those release cells that are going to continuously come up and replace the cells of the stomach as they're dissolved away. And you get this mucus, uh, mucus lining that helps protect them from the acid producing the stomach. Okay. Again, this is the lining of the stomach. And you can see the gastric pits, again, are these openings right down here right down between the grooves, okay? And down there, you can see it better of, of the mucus pits here, and you saw these on the, the, the light microscope picture of it with a simple columnar epithelium right here lining the stomach. Okay. Production of stomach acid enzymes controlled by your central nervous system. Again, the vagus nerve. The vagus nerve is parasympathetic. Parasympathetic is the, your relaxation one. Digestion's occurring, you're releasing all your enzymes. It's triggered by the sight and thought of food. When you start to salivate, you start releasing enzymes to start breaking down the food that you're anticipating getting. The celiac plexus is your sympathetic innervation. That shuts that whole system down. It stops the release of secretions in the stomach and keys the body up in other areas for the fight or flight response. Again, in the stomach, food enters the stomach, and the stomach stretches. Those are those rugae that allow you to stretch out. Stretching causes the G cells to release gastrin. Gastrin causes parietal cells and G cells to release their products. Remember, parietal cells reach hydrochloric acid. And uh, uh, for the, the vitamin B12. And the chief cells start to release pepsin. And the hydrochloric acid converts that into to pepsinogen, and they start to really and converts that into pepsin, so it becomes active. Okay, so let's see. So the G cells release gastrin. Gastrin causes parietal cells and G cells. And ent ent enteric factor. Okay, and hydrochloric acid. The G cells produce pepsinogen, which by hydrochloric acid goes to pepsin. And the pepsin starts to dissolve the proteins. Okay. So when the stomach is stretched, that's what happens. That's how it produces the enzymes to start breaking things down. Okay, small intestine. So the, the food from the stomach goes into the small intestine. The small intestine is about twenty feet in length, and it's one and a half to two and a half inches in diameter. There's three sections to the small intestine. There's the duodenum jejunum and ileum in that order, okay? Duodenum is the first part, jejunum is the middle part, ileum is the last part, okay? Most of the digestion of your body and absorption occurs in the jejunum, okay? So the duodenum, the first part is 10 inches long. It receives digestive enzymes from the pancreas and bile from the liver and gallbladder. So two organs, inject enzymes into the duodenum. That's your liver, okay? So bile from the liver and gallbladder get released in the duodenum and the pancreas releases its enzymes into the duodenum. Now don't get confused. The pancreas is an exocrine and an endocrine organ. We know the pancreas produces insulin and glucagon for blood sugar. That's not what it's releasing in the duodenum. Okay. It releases that, those hormones into the bloodstream. That's your endocrine function. The exocrine function of the pancreas 
releases enzymes into the duodenum. So don't miss that on the exam, okay? Nurse, nursing school also, you'll see that on your, your end class test for nursing school. The pain, because everybody thinks the pain, everybody knows the pancreas produces insulin and glucagon. That's not what it's releasing in the duodenum. It's releasing digestive enzymes that's being produced. Okay. The, end, the um, insulin and the glucagon are released directly into the bloodstream. Okay. Remember, it's an exocrine and endocrine organ. All right. And that's released in the duodenum. Jejunum is the next part. That's where most of your digestion and absorption occurs, is in the jejunum, okay? And the ileum is the last part of it. So again, your small intestine, your small intestine has three sections, duodenum, jejunum, and ileum, okay? There's your small intestine, enzymatic digestion, absorption of water, organic substrates, vitamins, and ions. That's the function of the small intestine. And here's the reason. This is your stomach right here. This is missing. Here's your greater stomach. And this is your esophagus feeding into it. The stomach extends up like that, actually. Okay. So food comes in here, goes to the pyloric sphincter, the pyloric part of the stomach, and it enters into the duodenum. This is a section right here. And right in here, there's two ducts. There's a duct that releases bile from the liver or the gallbladder. And there's a duct that releases the digestive enzymes from the pancreas into the duodenum. Duodenum turns into jejunum. Jejunum travels all across through here. Okay, that's your jejunum. Jejunum is where most of your digestion absorbs and occurs in jejunum. Jejunum then comes into the ileum, and this is your ileum, and it wraps around all through here and feeds into the cecum of your large intestine. If you can follow my, my red map there, you're in good shape. <laughs> but it's the, the duodenum, the jejunum, and the ileum. The duodenum receives food from the pyloric opening of the stomach. The duodenum goes into the jejunum, where most of your digestion and absorption occurs. Your jejunum goes into the ileum. Everything travels through the ileum, and the ileum goes into the cecum of the large intestine. Perfect. All right, support of the small intestine. The jejunum and the ileum are supported by the mesentery proper. Duodenum itself does not have any association with mesentery. It's locked into position there. The blood supply, tremendous blood supply in the small intestine. That's where all your zorgs is taking place. That's where all the things gotta get in your body. So around the jejunum, around the jejunum is gonna be tremendous, tremendous blood supply. Okay? Branch of the superior mesentery artery and intestinal arteries. And then the nerve supply, you have to have parasympathetic and sympathetic. You have to be all your digestive system. The parasympathetic is your vagus nerve. Your sympathetic is a superior mesenteric ganglion. Okay? Remember the vagus nerve is parasympathetic, which means it supports all the functions, all the release of the enzymes, all the aids it takes to help increase digestion. Your sympathetic shuts your digestion down. Okay? Get your body ready for that fight or flight response. Okay, this is the blood supply. The two main uh, arteries are your superior mesenteric as it comes down right here. And you see all the branches it takes as it comes down. And then you have the intestinal, which branches all these multiple branches here. You can see how all those branches cover over the small intestinal area, especially the jejunum. Because if you're gonna ingest all those materials, they gotta go somewhere. They gotta get into your blood to go to the body. So tremendous blood supply on the small intestine. All right, the small intestine contains pleca. We talked about that before. Pleca are microvilli that extend up into areas to increase secretion and increase absorption. Within each of those villi are capillaries. There's an artery, there's nerves, there's veins, and there's lymphatic systems, or lymphatic ducts, okay? Villi absorb digestive nutrients from the lumen of the small intestine and, for, and goes into the capillaries. That's to get into the capillaries. So this is what the pleca look like. Because there's these extensions that come up, okay? And you can see this is a line of stomach stomach. This is the rugae that you have here. Okay, so this gets flattened out as the stomach gets full. And all these pleca, what they do is tremendously increase the surface area. 
So there's a whole lot of places to absorb nutrients, which is what we want. Inside each of those villi, inside those plica, you can see there's an artery, there's a vein, and there's lymphatics. Because don't forget, you're going to have bacteria and everything else in the food. So you want lymphatics there also to get that out of the system so it doesn't go into your bloodstream. Okay. And remember the layers of your small intestine were your mucosa, the submucosa, muscularis externa, and the serosa. Those are the four layers of small intestine. And you can see the villi, and you can see all these little plica that are covering the entire line wall of the small intestine so you can absorb a great surface area there. Okay. And inside each plica, there's an artery, a vein, a nerve, and a uh, lymphatic vessel. With, once they're with small, like I'll call lacteals. These lacteals are your small lymphatic vessels that extend into the plica. Okay, inside the small intestine, you have what's called intestinal crypts. Okay, and those are at the base of these villi. Okay, so at the base of the villi, as these villi, as the plica stand up at the base here, these are your intestinal crypts. Okay, so new epithelial for, cells are front, just like the gastric pits, these are intestinal crypts. There are little depressions, areas, and that's where new cells are formed that can come and replace these areas as they're, as they're destroyed. So they contain endro-endocrine cells. They produce intestinal hormones, including cholecystokinin and secretin. Those are hormones that affect how things are absorbed. We'll get into that in just a little bit of those, the, both those different hormones. And they produce enzymes with antibacterial activity. Remember, this is a small, this is a small intestine. All that stuff you ate, I guarantee you didn't pick all the bacteria out before you ate it. There's a lot of bacteria coming into there. So these produce enzymes and these enzymes have antibacterial activity with them. Okay, here's the, here's the intestinal crypt. These little invaginate, just like the gastric pits, same thing. They produce cells that come and replace these cells in this area to help the lining of the small intestine. Okay, that's what I want to talk about. Okay, so each villus also contains a lacteal. Inside each extension, remember there's a blood vessel, artery, vein, and nerve, and a lacteal. Lacteal is your lymphatic vessel. Those are small lymphatic vessels that extend up into the pleca. So lacteals absorb materials that cannot be absorbed by the capillaries. Okay, they're part of the lymphatic system. So bacteria that are large, viruses, a lot of lipid protein, a lot of lipid th lipids, fats get absorbed by your lacteals and get put into, into the lymphatic system. Example, large lipid protein complexes that get in there, bacteria, things like that. So that's what lacteal means. Okay, and this is a real good view of the, of the pleca, of this uh, microvilli right here. It comes up and extends. And you can see arteries, you can see veins, you can see nerves, and you see lacteals your lymphatic system. And you have this whole capillary network where these arteries and veins interconnect with each other. And all these in capillary system absorb from that environment, from your intestine, all the nutrients into your blood vessels. Okay. The duodenum. Duodenum contains duodenal submucosa glands. These glands produce large amounts of mucus. The mucus has buffers to provide against the acid chyme. Remember, the chyme is coming, this chyme is coming straight from where? It's coming straight from the stomach, right? The stomach has a lot of hydrochloric acid. Okay, so this chyme is a very acidic. So you use mucus are buffers to help lower, uh, not to help raise the pH, make it less acidic. So entering the small intestine, okay, at the pancreatic sphincter region, you get bile from the liver and gallbladder. Okay. Remember, those are the, the liver and gallbladder secrete into the duodenum. They complete bile, helps dissolve lipids, fats, and you get buffers from the pancreas, not insulin and not glucagon. Don't get that mixed up. Every, a lot of people get that mixed up. I keep saying that. So the pancreas produces different things. It produces insulin and glucagon, which are hormones, which are uh, endocrine, and it produces buffers that are released into the duodenum small intestine. That's exocrine, released into an opening, okay? And you also get digestive enzymes from the pancreas. So the pancreas produces buffers and digestive enzymes and releases them into the duodenum. Okay. 
And here's a great picture of, we'll get into this in a little bit. We haven't gotten into this a whole lot, but this large organ is the liver. Okay. The liver has what's called, it produces a bile. It has hepatic ducts, it has a right hepatic duct and a left hepatic duct. These, these ducts right here. That's where the bile starts to, it's formed and starts to travel down. These two ducts meet and it's called the cystic duct. So bile goes into the cystic duct and starts to travel towards the duodenum. Halfway down, it runs into a pathway of the gallbladder. If there is no demand for bile in the, in the small intestine, it doesn't continue there. Okay, it backs up and feeds into the gallbladder. Okay, the gallbladder stores the bile and modifies it, condenses it until it's ready to use. When it's ready to use, you can turn it back down Okay, back down towards the cystic duct into what's called the common bile duct and feed into the duodenum. Okay, so the liver produces bile, the gallbladder does not. The gallbladder is simply a storage vessel for when either there's too much or there's no need for it. It just stores it in the gallbladder for later usage. Okay, and it backs it up through the cystic duct towards the gallbladder. Okay, you have a common hepatic duct. Okay. And then you have a common bile duct where it releases bile to it. And you can see this opening here, this little duct here, goes to the pancreas and allows your digestive and your um, enzyme, uh, digestive enzymes and your buffers to come from the pancreas into the duodenum. So there's two openings in the duodenum, one for the liver for bile and one for the pancreas for digestive enzymes and mucus. Okay. And we'll get into that a little bit more as we go through the liver and the hepatic duct. All right, so the jejunum and the ileum, we cover the duodenum. Duodenum is the first portion of the small intestine. So jejunum has very prominent pleca and villi, which you would expect because that's where most your absorption occurs. Okay, so you have a lot of pleca and a lot of villi. That's your jejunum. The ileum contains prominent lymphoid centers called what's called aggregate lymphoid nodules or Pierre patches. Those are your lymphoid nodules. That's where a lot of your bacteria, a lot of your high lipid stuff is absorbed out of your small intestine in the ileum. How the, how the small intestine is regulated. Here's our, sec, our secret our, our cholecystokinin we talked about, those, those hormones. Okay, upon vagal stimulation. Vagal stimulation is the 10th cranial nerve, the vagus nerve. Okay, the enteroendocrine cells of the small intestine release two hormones, secretin and cholecystokinin. Those two hormones are released. Remember, the vagal nerve is parasympathetic. Parasympathetic is increasing digestion. All the hormones get released and, and, and the digestive enzymes get released so digestion can occur. Okay. So it stimulates the enteroendocrine cells of your small intestine, and they produce secretin and cholecystokinin. Secretin causes the liver to start making bile. So it can break down fats that you have ingested. And it causes the pancreas to release its buffers into the duodenum. So the secretin causes those two things to occur. It makes the liver makes bile, pancreas release buffers into the duodenum. The cholecystokinin causes the pancreas to release its digestive enzymes into the duodenum. Remember that the, the pancreas makes two, two, th two things, buffers, and digestive enzymes. Okay. Cholecystokinin also causes the gallbladder to contract. So the gallbladder contracting puts more bile into the, into the cystic duct, into the, into the hepat, common hepatic duct, and then into the duodenum. Okay. And it causes the hepatopancreatic sphincter to open. Okay. That's the sphincter that closes those two ducts and those open so the flu, so the bile can flow in. And so the digestive enzymes and the buffers from the pancreas can flow into the duodenum. So that's what these two hormones do. They produce secretin and cholecystokinin, and that's their two functions. Large intestine is about five feet long, three inches in diameter, and consists of the, these different regions here. Now remember, the large intestine and the small intestine, the large intestine is shorter than the small intestine. It's thicker though, it's wider. That's the reason for the large versus the small. It consists of the cecum. The cecum is the part where the ileum feeds into the large intestine. That's your cecum, that's the beginning of your large intestine. The ascending colon goes up, 
So here's your cecum coming here. Then you have an ascending colon coming up. You have a transverse colon going across. You have a descending colon going down. Okay. Sigmoid colon. Sigmoid is S-shaped and it feeds into the rectum. Okay. I have one rectum joke. Okay. Little Billy runs into class. He goes, teacher, teacher. Johnny got hit by a train. The teacher goes, is he okay? He goes, no, he got hit right in the ass. The teacher goes, no, no, Johnny, not ass, rectum. Little Johnny goes, rectum, hell, nearly killed him. <laughs> no. <laughs> That's my rectum joke. <laughs> All right. So those are the parts of the large intestine. Okay, large intestine, enzymatic digestion, absorption of water, organic substrates, vitamins, and ions. Large intestine is where a lot of water gets resorbed. Compaction occurs in the food and it gets dehydrated. So we don't dehydrate our bodies. We resorb a lot of the water. It results in compaction of waste, which forms feces. Absorbs vitamins, which are produced by the, by the bacteria in your body. You get storage of fecal material prior to defecation, prior to getting rid of it. Okay. The blood supply of the large intestine. You receive blood from branches of the superior mesenteric artery and from the inferior mesenteric artery. Both these arteries supply blood into the large intestine, the superior mesenteric and the inferior mesenteric. This is the inferior mesenteric here. You see where it branches off and feeds into the large intestine here. And where are we at? Superior mesenteric branches off and feeds into the large intestine as it comes up through here. Okay. So the superior mesenteric feeds into the first or beginning part and the inferior mesentery feeds into the sigmoid colon and the rectum area of the large intestine. Okay, let's do, let's see where we at. Let's go right here. We'll stop right here at this slide. So the cecum, the cecum is intraperitoneal. So the ileum connects to the medial surface of the cecum. So the ileum connects to the cecum, the cecum connects to the large intestine. You have an ileocecal valve that regulates movement from the ilium to the cecum. So an ileocecal valve allows movement from the ilium, which is your small intestine, into the cecum, which is your large intestine. That's where your appendix attaches, your ver um, vermiform appendix attaches to the cecum. It's about nine centimeters long. And the mesial appendix, that's the mesentery, anchors the appendix to the ilium and the cecum. It holds the appendix in place. This is the ilium. This is coming up from the small intestine. This is the last part of the small intestine and it's gonna pass into the cecum. This is your cecum right here, okay? It passes through the ileocecal valve, okay? Ilium and cecum. So as, as, as the ileocecal valve opens, material passes from the ilium into the cecum. So it goes from the small intestine into the large intestine. Okay, in the cecum, you have anchored in the mesenchyme, you have the appendix. This is the extension right here. That's the veriform appendix. And again, with time during evolution, we're getting less and less use for that. And the appendices are getting smaller and smaller and smaller. Okay. The appendices store a lot of poisons from the body. If you rupture that or that leaks, that's an emergency surgery where those have to be taken care of and snipped off and then this end sealed. Okay. Now, from the ileocecal valve goes into the cecum, you enter into the large intestine. You have an ascending colon, which is your colon going up. Okay. You have the tran you have the right colic flexure, which is a flexure, it's a bend. So the right colic, this is your hepatic flexure because your liver sits right here. And this goes into your transverse colon. The transverse colon comes across. And this goes into your splenic flexure because your spleen sits right here. And that's just the flexures, the bend. And it goes into the descending colon. The descending colon goes into this S shape here, which is your sigmoid colon. Sigmoid colon goes into the rectum. Okay. So the large intestine is composed of your ascending colon, the hepatic flexure, where it bends, the transverse colon, the splenic flexure, where it bends, the descending colon, the sigmoid colon, and the rectum. Those are your parts or parts of the small intestine. And I look at the colon, 
you can see it's like a, like an earthworm. It's segmented. Okay, these segmentations are called haustra. The haustra allow the large intestine to expand, just like the rugae did inside the stomach. These are the haustra. These are the little segmentations, and as the stomach expands, it gets filled with fecal matter. Okay, these haustra expand allows the small intestine to expand. A large intestine. I'm sorry, I said small intestine. So the colon, reason of the colon, you're ascending, transverse, descending, and sigmoid. Those are the four regions of the small intestine, of the, ah, excuse me, large intestine. Okay, so the colon, waste material leaves the ileum and enters the cecum through the ileocecal valve. Waste material goes up the ascending colon, around the hepatic flexure where the liver is, okay, across the transverse colon, around the splenic flexure, which is where the spleen is, down the descending colon, around the sigmoid flexure, which is your S shape, to the sigmoid colon, into the rectum. That's the pathway through the large intestine. Okay, we just, just went over the same thing. The cecum comes into the ascending colon, which is this, transverse colon, descending colon, sigmoid colon, and rectum. Okay, we said the walls of the colon has what's called haustra. Those are like segmentations, like, like an earthworm has different segmentations to their body. Okay? That allows the colon to expand. The longitudinal muscles are called tenae coli, and these aid in peristalsis. They run along the length of the colon. As they contract, they push the material, the fecal material, as it condenses through the colon. The serosa has numerous flaps. Okay. Those are sacs of fat attached and extended from the intestine they're called omental appendices. That's what help protect the colon and keep it anchored into place. Okay. So here's your tenae coli. These are the muscles. You can see the longitudinal muscles here. When they contract, they're going to force material along the small intestine. Okay. These are the haustra. These are your segments that allow the, the, the colon to expand when it gets full. And this is the omental appendices, which your fat deposits and protect and insulate the colon. You can see those all along the side, running along the tenae coli muscles. At the end of the colon is the rectum. Okay, the rectum temporarily stores waste material. That's its job. It's the last portion of the rectum is called the anal canal. The anal canal consists of anal columns the anal canal enters the anus, which is the opening. Okay. So there's the rectum part up in here. These are your canals, your anal canals. Oh, there's the anal canal, there's the anal columns, I'm sorry. So this is the canal where it comes from the rectum, the anal canals. Then you have your anal columns and opening into the anus. And you can see the muscles here. This is your external anal sphincter right in here that controls the external environment. And this is your internal anal sphincter. The internal anal sphincter is an involuntary control. You cannot control the internal anal sphincter. It opens when it's ready, okay? You can control the external anal sphincter. The histology of the large intestine, the walls are thinner than the walls of the small intestine. The walls lack villi. They don't need that extra surface area like the small intestine. Most of your nutrients and everything else is absorbed in the jejunum of the small intestine. The large intestine is going to absorb your water to keep from dehydrating. You know, the walls lack all those villi. Has a lot of goblet cells. Has very distinct intestinal crypts. So it produces a lot of mucus that lubricate the undigested material. So all these little intestinal crypts in the large intestine from the goblet cells produce this mucus that lubricates your material as it passes through the large intestine through the colon. And it contains large lymphoid nodules. Again, this is all undigested stuff. That's where your bacteria is gonna be, okay? So that's where your lymph nodes are going to be to help prevent, help prevent that from entering your bloodstream, okay? So here's going through the colon, this is your omental appendices, your fat deposits around it. Tenae coli is your muscles, your hostum is your divisions. 
You have large lymphoid nodules embedded in the intestinal walls. You have the intestinal crypts, which are areas that dig down in between here. Okay. This is where the goblet cells are. These are your goblet cells in the crypts, and they produce mucus that help coat the undigested material. And again, the four layers of the, of the, of the colon are the same as the other ones, are the mucosa, the submucosa, the muscularis externa, and the serosa. Okay, moving of waste material to the transverse colon is slow. Allows for a water to be absorbed from the undigested material. Moving through the rest of the large intestine is very rapid, mass movement. So once it passes the transverse colon, it goes a lot quicker. The forced material into the rectum for later, it forced all the material into the rectum and then into the anal canal for later defecation. Distension of the rectal wall okay, stimulates the urge to defecate. The internal sphincter opens. Involuntary control. You cannot control that. When the rectal wall is stimulated, that internal sphincter opens. Okay. Fecal material moves then into the anal canal. And then the external sphincter opens when you have defecation. That one you can control. That allows you to defecate in appropriate places. Okay. <laughs> That one's under your control. Okay, this is what it looks like. This is a barium um, radiograph of, of the colon. And you can see, you can really see the haustra with this dye. You can see all these concentric segments. These are haustra. And you can see when they fill, that tends to thin out. It gives you like an accordion. It gives you a lot of room to open that up. And they can expand a lot with those haustra. Okay. This is your ascending colon right here, coming up. This is the hepatic flexure, where it bends, where your liver is. This is the transverse colon, across here. This is your splenic flexure, where the spleen is. This is your descending colon. This is your S-shape. That's your sigmoid colon. And this single point feeds into the rectum. And what am I missing here? Now this is the cecum right here. This is the opening. This is the beginning of your large intestine where the ileum feeds in through the ileocecal valve. Okay. But it, this actually shows really, really clear what the hostel look like, how segmented that the large intestine is to allow it to expand. Accessory glycetic glands, accessory digestive organs, okay? You have the salivary glands, which you talked about. We have parietid, submandibular, sublingual. We have the liver, which produces bile. We have the gallbladder, which stores bile. And we have the pancreas, which produces digestive enzymes. Okay, and... I'm drawing a blank on the other one. I'm going to cut them as you go along. All right. So salivary glands lubricate fluid containing enzymes, break down your carbohydrates, amylase, all three of them. The liver secretes bile, and the gallbladder stores it and concentrates it. The pancreas, the exocrine cells, secrete a buffer. That's it. That's the, going to go. Buffers and digestive enzymes. Okay, buffers to raise the pH to make it less acidic as it comes from the stomach. It was right in the duodenum. Okay. All right, so the liver. The liver is your largest visceral organ of the body. Okay, it's involved in meta metabolic regulation, hematological regulation, and bile production. Okay, metabolic regulation. All blood that leads the digestive tract enters the liver. Okay, so all your blood that you're absorbing stuff from through your, your um, digestive tract enters the liver and it enters it through the hepatic portal system. Hepatocytes are liver cells and they adjust circulating metabolites before the blood enters back into the systemic circulation. Okay. Hematological regulation, blood. Liver is the largest blood reserve of the body. Okay. As blood passes through the liver, 
You get phagocytic cells where you have older damaged erythrocytes. Okay, so they can be recycled a little later. And it synthesizes plasma proteins for blood clotting. Okay. It, it synthesizes all the platelets. Okay. So the blood can clot. Bile production. Bile is made by liver cells, which are hepatocytes. Bile is stored in the gallbladder. The gallbladder does not make or produce bile. The bile is secreted in the duodenum when it's needed. What bile does, it emulsifies fat. It suspends the fat in the small intestine so it can be broken down. Emulsification makes it easy for lipase to actually digest the fat. Okay, so digestive metabolic functions of the liver, that synthesis and secretion of bile, storage of glycogen and liver, lipid reserves. Okay, synthesis of cholesterol bound transport proteins, inactivates toxins, and storage of iron reserves. It's the digestive metabolic functions of your liver. Okay. All right, who's paying attention? What's this pointing to? What's this section right here? It's kind of been cut away. This is pointing to this area right here. What is that? Transverse colon. Transverse colon. Perfect. What's going across? Next one points to the blue area. This section right here. That would be what? The duodenum? Duodenum of the small intestine. That's the first thing of the small intestine. Because remember, your stomach's right here. Okay, and that's where your esophagus enters. Okay. What's this purple section right here? Is that what's pointing to next? Yeah. Jejunum? What? Jejunum. What's, what's, what, what makes your jejunum famous? What does it do? That's where what occurs? The chemical digestion. Of the Most of your digestion. Most of your digestion, perfect, occurs in your uh, jejunum. And then the next one, uh, let's see where jejunum. And the next part is what? Ilium. That's the ilium. That's the last part. All right. And then this is pointing to this column right here, which is what? The ascending colon. Ascending colon. colon. Perfect. Ascending colon. And then what's this section of the colon right here? Cecum. That's the cecum. Cecum is the beginning of the large intestine where the ileum feeds into it. And there's a little valve right here that allows material to pass. What's that valve called? I know it's not on here, but... Ileocecal valve. Ile Ileocecal valve. Perfect. And this little fish tail right here, this little extension. What's that called? Appendix. Okay, that's your very form appendix. Perfect. Mm -hmm. I'm going to modify my slide a little bit. I'm working. All right. And this one is pointing to this section right here. Descending colon. Perfect. Descending colon. And then this one's pointing to this section right here. Sigmoid. Sigmoid. That's your S-shape. And this is pointing to this right here, which is your? Rectum. Rectum. Perfect. All right. Very good. All right. Uh, more accessory glands, the uh, liver. And now in the liver, the liver has what's called a falciform ligament that marks the boundary between the left and right lobes of the liver. It's a real thick connective tissue portion that goes right between the left and right lobes. The inferior portion of the falciform ligament becomes thick and round as it forms, and it becomes called the round ligament. The round ligament used to be the fetal umbilical vein. Okay, so that's what it forms. The falciform ligament spreads on the surface of the liver, attaches to the inferior side of the diaphragm. So it holds the liver in place, this round ligament. 
This ligament is called a coronary ligament as it spreads down. That's what holds your liver in place. So here's the liver. This is the round ligament as it comes down. This is the falciform ligament as it cuts right between the left and right lobes. As it gets thinner and spreads out, it becomes the coronary ligament. And here you can see the right lobe, liver, left lobe, and the gallbladder where it sits. The liver is supplied by blood by two arteries, the hepatic artery proper and the hepatic portal vein. Okay, those are the two blood supplies to the liver, the hepatic artery proper and the hepatic portal vein. Okay, here's the hepatic artery proper as it comes in and you can see it entering the hilum of the liver right here. Remember the hilum is where your arteries, veins, and lymphatics all exit and enter into the organ. So the hepatic artery proper enters the hilum of the liver. The liver is divided into approximately 100,000 little lobules. Each lobule is severed by an interlobular septum. So that means a division. The center of each lobule consists of a vein from the hepatic portal system. That's your filtering system right there in the liver. That's how the blood gets through. The hepatocytes, which are your liver cells, are arranged that form uh, cellular lines that extend from the central vein. So they surround the central vein, so everything's dumped into it after it goes through those cells. So this is what it looks like. This is a hepatic portal area where you have your artery, your vein, and your lymphatics coming through. Okay. This is your interlobular septum right here. This is the division line. This is going to be your septum. Six sides that divides each of those sections. Okay. And in the center of it, you will have your vein where blood, dr blood drains back out through the liver. Okay. Spaces are created between the lines of the liver cells, the hepatocytes. These spaces are called sinusoids. Those are the spaces. They consist of capillaries that lead to the central vein. The central vein is on each of those septum systems that develops. And in the liver, you have what's called cupra cells. Cupra cells are your phagocytic cells of the liver. That's what destroys the bacteria and everything else that enters it. Okay, bad red blood cells, so it can be recycled. Those are your cupra cells. <laughs> so each of these lobules has a hexagonal shape. We just saw that. There was a shape, there was a hexagonal shape that went around with your central vein in the center. And then these are your septum, your dividing lines. And then there's the next one, and the next one, and so on and so on. And they just keep dividing into six layer hex 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 hexagons. And that's how the liver is lined up. So each of the six corners, so at every one of these corners, feeding into that central vein, you have six corners on a hexagon. Okay. At every corner, you have a hepatic portal vein, you have a bile duct, a hepatic artery proper. Okay. And these form what's called the hepatic triad, the triad vessels of the liver. Okay. So here you see one of the sides, here's one side, here's a second side, the third side goes up here and so on. Okay. So these are your sinusoids, those are your spaces between them. These are the cupra cells. Cupra cells are phagocytic cells. They eat bacteria, they eat the red blood cells that are damaged, they can be recycled. You have canaliculi, which are small canals connecting them together. You have a branch of the hepatic portal vein. You have a branch of the hepatic portal artery. And you have the bile duct. These three things form the hepatic triad. And they occur at each corner of the six sides of the, each, uh, each lobule. And in the center of each lobule is a central vein. So you got a hepatic triad at every of those six corners. And in the center is the hepatic vein, the central vein. Okay? And then you can see the hepatocytes, these are just your liver cells that are throughout all that. Okay? So bile secretion. So, so hepatocytes produce bile. That's the cell that makes bile. Bile enters the can, uh, bile enters, goes to the bile canaliculi travels through the bile ducts, collects in the left and right hepatic ducts, travels through the common hepatic artery, then travels through the common bile duct, okay, to the duodenum. 
okay, go through the dots, what's called a hepatopancreatic sphincter, or travels through the cystic duct into the gallbladder. So that as it goes through these here, it can back up into the cystic duct where your gallbladder is. So this is your cystic duct. Then we continue on that system or go straight down. Okay. So this is what it looks like. This is your liver. Again, this is your round ligament up here. You can see that. Okay. So this is the right hepatic duct. This is the left hepatic duct. And it feeds into the common hepatic duct. That's coming out of the liver. That's your bile. So you have, a, you have a hepatic duct on the right and left, and it feeds in and they fuse to form the common hepatic duct. Now the common hepatic duct can go down and continue into the common bile duct, or it can back up through the cystic duct and feed into the gallbladder. Ah, go back, okay? And it can feed into the gallbladder right there, okay? If it goes through the common bile duct, it goes down, around the stomach and feeds into the duodenum. Okay. So it can go two places. If there's a demand for bile or if there's too much bile already backing up the duct, it backs up into the gallbladder. Remember the gallbladder does not make bile. It just stores it. That's all it does. That's where you can function without a gallbladder. It stores it and concentrates the bile. Okay, so remember that you have a left and right hepatic duct from the liver forming a common hepatic duct. That common hepatic duct can do two things. It can back up into the gallbladder through the cystic duct, or it can feed into the duodenum through the, through the, uh, the common bile duct. Those are the two choices it has. The gallbladder itself divided into three regions called the fundus, the body, and the neck. Your cystic duct leads from the neck of the gallbladder to the common bile duct. So it can feed into the duodenum. So here's your gallbladder. Here's your cystic duct. This is where the bile has a choice of either going to the common bile duct and into the duodenum or backing up the cystic duct into the gallbladder. This is the neck of the gallbladder. The neck of the gallbladder is where the cystic duct enters. Then the gallbladder has a body, which is the main portion. And then it has a fundus, which is the very outer edge, outer part of the gallbladder. So the fundus is the part farthest away from the cystic duct. The body of the gallbladder is the center of it. And then the neck is where the cystic duct attaches. Function of the gallbladder is to store bile and then modify it. I guarantee you're going to see that on your end class exam. I guarantee it's on there every year. True or false? The bile and the gallbladder and the liver produce bile for the emulsification of fats in the duod in the in the small intestine. That's false. Everybody see why? The gallbladder does not produce bile. The only one that produces bile is hepatocyte cells of the liver. The gallbladder releases bile into the small intestine, yes, because it stores it. And when the body needs it, the gallbladder contracts, squeezes the bile through the cystic duct into, the, into the, uh, the, the, the common cystic duct and then out into the common bile duct, so the common bile duct into the duodenum, okay? So all the gallbladder does is store bile and modify it. It concentrates it, okay? So when hepatic sphincter is closed, okay, the bile enters the cystic duct, it backs up, okay? And goes into the gallbladder. The gallbladder can store 40 to 70 milliliters of bile. Water is continuously removed from the stored bile, concentrated bile more and more. And that's what causes gallstones, uh, gallbladder stones. Water is continuously removed from the stored bile. And that's what causes it to, to concentrate. If food entered the small intestine is high in fat, the small intestine cells will release cystic cholecystokinin. Remember, cholecystokinin is secreting and released by those cells. The cholecystokinin causes gallbladder to release its bile down the common bile duct. Cholecystokinin causes the gallbladder to contract, which releases bile. Cholecystokinin also causes the pedopancreatic sphincter to open. So now the bile can go from the common, common bile duct into the duodenum. So when it opens up, the cholecystokinin causes the gallbladder to contract. The bile goes from the neck of the gallbladder into the cystic duct. 
Okay, it enters the common bile duct. Okay, the hepatopancreatic sphincter opens up and enters into the duodenum of the small intestine, and there it emulsifies fat, making it easier for the, uh, the lipase to break down the fat. That's released in the small intestine. Okay, so here's your summation one more time. Here's your gallbladder, cystokinin, causes this to contract. So, go, so bile will flow into the cystic duct again, and it'll travel down the common bile duct. Okay, from the other, the hepatic pancreatic sphincter opens up, which is this right here, and now bile can flow into the duodenum of the small, of the small intestine. Okay. The pancreas, pancreas is posterior to the stomach. Pancreas consists of a head, a body, a tail. The head is nearest the curvature of the duodenum. That's the head of the pancreas. The body is the rest of it that extends towards the spleen, and the tail is the rounded end of the pancreas that is near the spleen. So you have a head, a body, and a tail. The pancreatic duct okay, delivers secretions from the pancreas to the duodenum through the hepatic pancreatic sphincter, just like the gallbladder and the liver. Okay, so here's the pancreas. Here's the head of the pancreas. Here's the body, and here's the tail. The spleen's located right here. This is your spleen. Okay, so you have a head, a body, and a tail for your pancreas. Okay, so the pancre uh, pancreatic duct allows the enzymes to flow out of there into the duodenum of the small intestine. Perfect. So pancreas and exocrine cells secrete buffers and digestive enzymes. The endocrine cells secrete your hormones. They don't go to the same place. Remember the pancreas is an exocrine and an endocrine organ. The exocrine function releases buffers and digestive enzymes into the uh, duodenum of the small intestine. The hormones secreted by, by the beta cells of the pancreas are insulin and glucagon are released into the bloodstream. That's your endocrine function. Okay. So the pancreas consists of lobules also like the liver. In each, ovule, in each lobule, there are acinar cells and pancreatic islet, islets. The, the acinar cells produce your digestive enzymes. Those go through the pancreatic duct to the small intestine, to the duodenum. Your pancreatic islets produce hormones. Those hormones, insulin, glucagon, those go to the bloodstream to travel to target organs. They enter the bloodstream. They do not enter the small intestine. Okay? They, don't not, they do not go through the pancreatic duct. Different delivery systems. And you see all the lobules giving it like a corn on the cob appearance or honeycomb appearance. And all the lobules that make up the pancreas. Again, this is the head, this is the body, this is your tail. These are the ACE in our cells that produce your buffers and your digestive enzymes. These are the pancreatic islet cells, which produce your insulin, your glucagon hormones. Okay, this is what it looked like under a light microscope. The pancreatic cells you can see, and the pancreatic islets where they're accumulated. All right, the enzymes released by the pancreas from the ACE in our cells. You have lipases, which digest lipids. You have carbohydrases, which digest carbohydrates. You have nucleases, which digest nucleic acids. And you have proteinases, which digest proteins. Okay. So you break down fat, carbohydrates, nucleic acids, and proteins from the pancreatic enzymes released into the duodenum to the pancreatic duct. The hormones we talked about, insulin, glucagon, somatostatin, okay? Those are not released into the hepatic duct. Those are released into the bloodstream. Insulin decreases blood sugar. Glucagon increases blood sugar. Somatostatin is your growth hormone. So it inhibits gastric secretions and somatotropin, the release of those, and the growth hormone inhibit inhibitory hormone. So insulin decreases your blood sugar, glucagon increases increases blood sugar, 
and somatostatin as the uh, your growth hormone. Remember, yeah, the two uh, release of the pancreas, but I'll release the two hormones, um, cholecystokinin and secretin. Cholecystokinin from the small intestine causes the pancreas to release its digestive enzymes. Both those hormones function on the pancreas. Secretin from the small intestine causes the pancreas to release its buffers. Okay. So when food leaves the stomach and there's the duodenum, the chyme, which is what's produced in the stomach, is mixed with acid in the stomach. Okay. So the acid chyme and there's duodenum, so buffers raise the pH to attain the normal value between seven and eight. Stomach acid is around one or two. So the buffers released by secretin from the pancreas allow that pH to rise to help neutralize the stomach, and neutralize the chyme inside the, the, large, the small intestine. All right, as you get older, stem cell reproduction declines. So tissue repair decreases. The tissue becomes more fragile. Your smooth muscle tone decreases. Motility decreases, so constipation increases. It doesn't pass through as easily. Cumulative damage becomes apparent. Gradual loss of teeth, that is not true. As you get older, you should not lose teeth. Okay, if you maintain good oral hygiene, go to the dentist every six months, get them scaled, get them cleaned. There is no reason you not keep your teeth the rest of your life. Okay. It's, 50 years ago, we would have agreed with that, but not now, okay? Accumulation of toxins over time, especially in your liver, occurs. Cancer rates increase. Colon cancer and pharyngeal cancer are areas where there's a lot of abrasion, a lot of assault to the body in those areas. 